paragraph 9, you say on the 14th of November right. 2023, okay. Okay. Right. I was informed by members of Fujitsu's right. legal team that a series of ARQ spreadsheets were provided by Fujitsu to poll in response to an ARQ request and then some information that was provided to you at that time. Right, OK. It, it, is that accurate? Um, well, um, if it's written down, it must be right. I can't remember the specific date. It's well, that sort of time, certainly. If it assists you to have your statement in front of you, the bundle should have that second statement at tab A2. Okay, thank you. And you say at paragraph nine that you were told that the issue related to a series of ARQ spreadsheets provided by Fujitsu to the post office in response to an ARQ request from the post office dated the 11th of August 2023 relating to the Apex Corner branch. The context for the ARQ request was an ongoing appeal by the former sub-postmaster of Apex Corner, which was before the Court of Appeal, is that right? That's right, yes. In the request, the post office had requested transaction data relating to Apex Corner for a number of months, which included the months of March and April 2008, is that right? That's right, yes. In response, Fujitsu provided the post office with a number of ARQ spreadsheets, including a spreadsheet for March 2008, and separately, a spreadsheet for April 2008. Is that right? That's right, yes. And as a result of comparing the spreadsheets for March and April 2008 with a gyro check report dated 10th of April 2008, produced by the postmaster for the appeal, it was discovered, wasn't it, that there were 13 transactions which appeared in the gyro check report but did not appear in any of the ARQ spreadsheets produced by Fujitsu. Is that a fair summary? That's correct, yes, that's correct. By way of explanation, you say in your statement you were told that information from relevant peaks, a known error log, and operational correction requests showed a number of things. First, the 13 missing transactions, which had taken place in March 2008, had been marooned on the counter at Apex Corner, together with a large number of other transactions in 2008. Yes? That's correct, yes. Second, this had been discovered in April 2008 by the Software Support Centre, and they had manually reinserted these marooned transactions into the Legacy Horizon correspondence servers. Yes? That's correct, yes. Third, these marooned transactions were reinserted into the correspondence using a virtual counter ID, and the use of that virtual counter ID was the reason that the SSC transaction reinsertions had been identified. That's right, yes. You have been investigating the Apex Corner incident, is that right? That's, that's correct, yes, yes. Starting, please, with the first of the pieces of information you were provided with in November 2023, the fact that the transactions were marooned on the counter at Apex Corner in March 2008. Can you explain, pre please, what you mean by this, being marooned on the counter? Well, it, it's, um, this is really not, not my technical area, but basically um, there was some technical problem and the uh, messages weren't uh, co copied to the correspondence servers at that time so that um, they didn't um, appear in the audit, the normal audit data. But it's not, uh, not really my area, that my technical area, that. 
to the extent that you can help, how would marooned transactions have appeared to a sub-postmaster using the system in branch? I would have thought, well, I, I, can't, be, I can't be certain, but I would have thought that it looked okay. It was only sort of behind the scenes that you'd have had a problem. Uh, but I can't, it's, I can't be certain. I can't be certain to that question, the answer to that question. Coming on to the discovery of the marooned transactions, is it your understanding that these were discovered by the Software Support Centre following a call from the sub-postmaster reporting problems, or can't you say? Um, I, I think um, that, that's, yeah, I can't be certain, but it sounds right, it sounds right. I can't, as I say, it's not really, that side of things isn't my technical area, but it sounds right, and from what I've heard uh, since. Can you help with how the SSC discovered the marooned transactions when they investigated the matter? Uh, n can't, can't be certain on that point, no. Uh, no, no, I can't. Can't really comment on that point. Can you help with whether the marooned transactions would have come to light at all had the sub master not called the software support centre? Uh, I can't comment for sure. Sounds like probably not, but not, not again, not my technical area of expertise, that. And your understanding of what they did in April 2008, that is the Software Support Centre, was to remotely access the counter in branch using a virtual ID and reinsert the transactions which had become marooned. Is that right? That's right. Now, that bit I do understand. That's correct. That, that is, that's what they did. Yes, yes. Now, now I'm understanding again. Yes. Setting aside the technical explanation for Fujitsu's production of incomplete ARQ data, in simple terms, is it right that it was the remote reinsertion of transactions a month after they were actually done that caused a problem? That's right, exactly. And it, the key thing here, it was a month afterwards. That, that's the key. If they'd done it very quickly, there wouldn't have been a problem with the audit system. But because it was a month afterwards, there was. Is it right that the SSC's actions in this regard was only ascertained because of the presence <coughs> of the virtual counter ID? Well, that... Uh, uh, that was certainly a um, indicator. So the virtual, though you see, uh, you, you, can, you can have counter offices with 20 counters, so uh, you need a bit more knowledge than that. But it was an unusually high counter. They add, they add 10 to the, the normal counter number, I believe, as I understand it. You say at paragraph 93 of your statement, uh, these marine transactions were reinserted into the correspondence using a virtual counter ID, brackets, i.e. a counter that did not exist at the branch, which ah. was used to identify yes, right. that they had been reinserted by the SSC. That they didn't exist at that branch. What I'm saying in general, with the multi-counter <laughs> offices, you could have had such a high counter number, but at that branch, there wouldn't have been. Yes, that's correct, yes. Is it right that had the sub-postmaster in this case not had a gyro check report showing the 13 missing transactions, the inaccuracy of the ARQ data produced to the appeal court would not have come to light? I think that's highly likely. I mean, it was a completely new issue to me. I've never, um, never come across this before, so it was um, completely new issues to me. So I would say what you say is correct, yes. Before we come to your investigation of why the reinserted transactions were not retrieved by the ARQ process applied in 2023, I would like to ask you please about a discrete aspect of the Horizon Online ARQ process. There is a suggestion at paragraph 17 of your statement, that second statement in front of you.
that once an ARQ spreadsheet had been produced using audit workstations, Fujitsu's security team would do an extra step. Can we have that paragraph on screen, please? It's page 10 of WITN 0987020. You say, my understanding is that the security team would identify gaps and duplicates in messages through automatic checks and occasionally identify that whole days of messages were missing at the end of an ARQ spreadsheet following a manual review of the spreadsheet. This would sometimes be drawn to my attention by the security team who would ask me to investigate the gaps and find the missing messages by extending the retrieval range of the ARQ while keeping the filter range the same. Are, yeah. you, are you saying here that ARQ spreadsheets produced by the ARQ process were and are checked for completeness before they're signed off? Is that what you're saying? Right. Well, there's, there's two aspects for this. First of all, automatically, uh, gaps in the message run and duplicates in the message run are, are performed by the software. And when the spreadsheet is produced, there's a, a summary table which states whether there are any gaps or duplicates. Um, however, uh, so that identifies most problems, but obviously with gaps, if you get to the end of the range, well, you can't really be certain because there's nothing beyond it, as it were. So it's really up to the operator. If he sees a whole day missing at the end of the range, then he knows something's wrong. So that, so that would be drawn to my attention sometimes. And the answer then, almost always, was to add a few extra days to the uh, retrieval range, and because the um, uh, the relevant transactions were in a slightly gathered slightly late. That, so that was almost always the answer. So, so it's aut automatic checking of the gaps, plus. Because the automatic gap checking can't check at the very end of the range, manually checking to make sure there are not whole days missing at the very end, if that makes sense. So if the security team considered messages were missing, they'd contact you, is that what you're saying? Yes, that's well, I mean, that sometimes they might take their own initiative and add, add an extra ex initiative and add a few extra days, I suppose, but uh, sometimes they would contact me and I would go down and have a look. And as I say, I would investigate and very often say, ah, yes, these files were gathered late. You just need to add a few extra days to your retrieval range. Uh, and just to explain what you mean by that, is that rerunning the retrieval request with a wider date range? Exactly, exactly, yes, exactly. You're not talking then about manually inserting transactions? No, no, no. This is simply the missing transactions we're just gathered late, so you just need to... Or always, we had an extra three days, I think it is. Or there's a considerable number of days that you can add to the retrieval range. We'll just make it a bit long, bit, bit bigger, and that can cater for most, most issues. Coming then to your findings as to the technical cause of the incomplete ARQ data being produced by Fujitsu, Taking it sim as simply as possible, and please correct me if at any stage I fall into error. Is it right that under the old legacy Horizon ARQ process, transactions sent from the counter to the audit archive were given a transaction date as well as a sealed date on which the file containing them was added to the audit archive? That's right, yes. It the, just disappeared from my screen, is there? Uh, that, that's fine. You oh, don't need that document right, right. at this stage. If there's anything you'd like to see, your second statement, right. which you have in front of you, may assist. Um, the 13 missing transactions, which had transaction dates in March 2008, were not sealed in files in the audit archive until April 2008 because they were marooned and then reinserted by S a month after they were in fact conducted. When the Apex Corner ARQ request was processed, the data was filtered to retrieve one, 
transactions with a March 2008 transaction date from the file sealed in March 2008, and two, transactions with an April tra 2008 transaction date from the files sealed in April 2008. What were not sought were transactions with a March 2008 transaction date from the file sealed in April 2008, and therefore the 13 missing transactions were not retrieved. Exactly, that was the problem, yes. In the course of your investigation, you applied a revised query for March 2008 transactions from fiat files sealed in April 2008, is that right? That's right, yes. Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 20 of Mr Barnes's second statement? That's page 11 of WITN 0987020. And you say this, once this revised query was applied, the 13 missing transactions were retrieved and presented on an ARQ spreadsheet, and the automatic checks noted at 16C identified gaps in the messages that had been reinserted by the SSC on the virtual counter. At this stage, I am not sure why there were gaps in relation to these messages, and the investigation is ongoing in this regard. Can you explain what you mean by gaps in the messages which had been reinserted? Right, well, um, well after all the files are retrieved, um, each message has, each message has a, a number and they're all sequel, uh, sequential. So always the, the software automatically checks that there are no gaps so that uh, you can be sure that nothing's been missed out. Um, but for these um, special inserted transactions, there were gaps. Now, normally gaps is well, practically unheard of. It, it just doesn't happen. We check for it all the time and it never happens, but they were happening for these um, inserted transactions by the SSC. Not too sure why that was, but um, I suppose because they were uh, done in a slightly unusual way because of the manual insertion but so um, normally gaps is unheard of really it just it just doesn't well we always check for it but it's very very rarely reported and it always a thorough investigation occurs when there are gaps found does this mean on the face of it that the SSC did not reinsert the transactions accurately well I don't know the answer really um, I, I, I just don't know. I don't know quite the answer there, uh, so I can't. I can't be certain on that point. You say that investigation is ongoing in this regard. Do you, it may follow from your last answer, answer, but do you have any update in relation no, to your uh, investigation not, or that of others? No, we're, we're looking at another aspect actually at the moment. We're concentrating on that. Uh, but um, yes, I could get back. I could have another look at that point. But I haven't. I haven't found anything myself. Uh, I was hoping someone else might co have commented on it. Turning then to the extent and impact of the ARQ extraction issue. You deal with this over the page at paragraph 21. Could we go to that paragraph, please? And you say this, based on the investigation so far, in general terms, my understanding is that the ARQ extraction issue can occur in the following circumstances. A, there is delay between one, the date that a transaction was carried out <laughs> at a branch, and two, the date that the TMS file containing the transaction was sealed in the audit archive. B, the delay is caused by error or fault, e.g. counter hardware failures, a fault with the sealer, network connectivity problems, which leads to transaction messages that took place in month A being stored in the audit archive in TMS files that are sealed in month B, e.g. in the Apex Corner incident, the SSC reinserted the 13 missing transactions and others using a virtual counter ID. C, an ARQ request is received requesting data for the branch, including in relation to month A. 
D, the current Horizon Online ARQ process is followed to respond to the ARQ request, and the sealed TMS files relating to the branch for month B are not searched for transactions that took place in month A. And E, the automatic checks noted at paragraph 16C above fail to identify any gaps in the transaction messages that would indicate the transaction is missing. You then say this at 22, the Apex Corner incident has shown that the current Horizon Online ARQ process has a flaw because transactions in Legacy Horizon for one month can be stored in the audit archive in the following month, such that the additional days allowed in the retrieval range are not enough to capture all the relevant TMS files that were sealed late. As a result, Fujitsu is modifying the process to allow three months in the retrieval range, i.e. the date range applied to retrieve TMS files. <coughs> Hence, it will ret re retrieve up to two months of lately sealed or inserted messages. You say at paragraph 23 that you are working with other technical and operational staff in the POA to understand the extent and impact of the ARQ extraction issue. In relation, including in relation to Legacy Horizon and Horizon Online. First of all, what steps have been taken to investigate this? Well, what we're doing at the moment, we're concentrating on the um, Legacy Horizon, but um, what we're going to do is, um, a colleague of mine is writing some software to do this, is we're going to extract every month of the cluster files and search them for any cases where there's um, a transaction in them uh, which is in the following month or, or any higher, higher, higher month that is and, and produce a report on that so we'll see how common it is. So that's what, that's what we're doing right at the moment. That's what we're concentrating on. And do you have any update or findings which you're able to tell us about today? My colleague has I read an email from him saying he's got some test results to be looked at, but unfortunately, I, like yesterday, I was concentrating on my statements, but um, I should be looking at that this afternoon when I get back. Sir, those are all the questions that I have for Mr. Barnes. Um, I think there are some questions from core participants, but before I turn to them, do you have any questions? Well, what I'd just like to know, just so that there are no um, possibility of cross wires, this last um, uh, <coughs> topic that you've been covering arose in the context of an appeal to the Court of Appeal, as I understand it. Do, does either Mr. Barnes or does the inquiry know whether that appeal has been determined? I, I don't know. I, I know it is, was a, because of an appeal. I don't know the answer to that. Our, our Fujitsu legal team would probably know, but uh, but um, you don't know. Do, don't do we know, know it personally? Sir, right. I'm I, I'm told that it hasn't uh, by those who represent the post office. Right. Um, well, then I think if if there is an ongoing appeal. Um, we all need to tread a little carefully, so I need to give some thought to how much further the inquiry should delve into this prior to a determination by the Court of Appeal. Um, so that's a rather long-winded way, long way of saying, Mr. Barnes, that the inquiry will contact you rather than you contact the inquiry if we need any further information about this aspect of your evidence, just so that I can be careful not to interfere in any way in the processes of an ongoing appeal. Thank you, sir. Shall I turn to core participants? Yes, please. Uh, Ms. Page has uh, some questions, sir. Yeah. Mr. Barnes, my name's Flora Page, and I act for a group of sub-postmasters. Could we have, please, a document up? It's FUJ 00189289. And I hope this document is one you've had a chance to look at. It's only very recently been given to you. Uh, 
Have you had a chance to see this, Mr Barnes? Um, I th possibly, I, I think I might need to... Um, Perhaps we could zoom in a little bit on the lower half of the page from the heading that says EOD and migration. Yes, I, I read a lot of extra material. I don't quite remember this one. But anyway, you're welcome to ask me a question about it. I'll do my best to answer. Well, the first question, which will tell me whether we need to ask any more, really, is whether migration prep is the uh, migration software that you said that you were primarily involved with. Oh, um I think, yes, I think that that was a different bit of software. That was, uh, yes, I, oh, uh, as a long time ago, there was some counter software where you press a button to do the migration, which I definitely remember writing. Um, I think, yes, I think I did write the m migration prep too, but I might have got that wrong. It's a di yeah, it's an end of day process. Yes, right? I, th I think so, but... Uh, the, the reason I ask is because what we see described here is migration prep failing in the way that perhaps you say it sh software should fail. In other words, um, it's very apparent when it encounters a problem, it just sort of falls over, I think. Um, and we see that the reason it has fallen over when this sort of problem is described is because SSC messages which were inserted remotely seem to have interfered in some way and caused migration prep to, to fail. Does that make sense? Makes sense, yes, makes sense. Um, and, and so that might be an example of what you describe as sort of good error handling. Is that, is that right? Well, that, that's the idea. If something, something's wrong... Um, it's far better just to stop uh, than, uh, than sort of keep going and report the error, then hopefully it can be fixed and then you can produce correct reports. Yes, that's the idea, yes, certainly. What we seem to have here uh, when we, we go down a little bit is in, uh, just stopping at the paragraph that starts, hmm, sorry, just a little further up. Hmm. In the last year or so, SSE have developed a tool which did go through LST testing, which will insert EOD messages for a branch. This is normally used when a branch has closed down and the kit removed before EOD. That's end of day, yes? That's right. Yeah, that's on correct. the last day of trading. So there are messages on the correspondence server which will never be harvested unless we take some action. The tool writes the necessary messages on the correspondence server, hence there may be end of days on nodes other than one. It then says, we have also used the same tool very occasionally on branches which aren't closed, but where, for example, one counter has been down for over a week, resulting in none of the transactions for the branch being harvested. And there are continuing problems trying to replace the box. And they give a number. And then they also talk about, in the final sentence, or where kit was removed for a two-week refurbishment without writing a full end of day. So it looks like what's happened is those messages which are inserted following hardware failures or following a branch closing have caused migration prep or uh, the, the migration process to fail. Right, OK, yes. Is there, is there really any way of knowing how often these inserted messages caused other processes to fail silently? Mm. 
Not really, I suppose. Uh, um, other, no, I, I suppose not. I suppose not is the answer. Not for certain. Well, thank you, Mr. Barnes. That's um, those are my questions for you. Is that it? Sir, that appears to be it for core participant questions, yes. Well, thank you for returning today, uh, Mr. Barnes, and for answering further questions. And as I've said, I don't expect you to provide any more information to the inquiry unless we spe specifically ask you to do so. All right? Okay, thank you. We have Mr. Sewell next. Right. So um, I'll remain where I am, so to speak, but just uh, turn off my video for a few minutes. Yes, sir. Back just after 25 2. Thank you.
Good morning, sir. Good morning, uh, Mr. Blake. Um, the next witness is Mr. Sewell. Yeah. Good morning, sir. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you give your full name, please? Peter James Sewell. Uh, Mr. Sewell, you should have in front of you a witness statement. I think it's either at the front of that file or yes. behind the first tab. Yes. Um, it has a unique reference number of WITN 09710100. Um, is that dated the 8th of September 2023? Yes, sir. Could I ask you to have a look at the final page or the final substantive page? That's page 12. Is that your signature? It is. Thank you. Can, can you please confirm that that statement is true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is. Thank you very much. Mr. Sewell, that witness statement will go into evidence and will be published on the inquiry's website in okay. due course. Um, I'd like to start with a bit of your background. I think you joined, was then ICL in 1997, is that correct? Yes, yes, 97. We've heard quite a lot of evidence about the rollout of Horizon. Were you involved in the rollout of Horizon? Uh, only in the positions that I've stated in my... Um, typically, say, in the year 2000, then, what kind of involvement would you have had with the Horizon system? Uh, I was probably manager of a development team in that area. So you were on the technical side? No, no, no. I, was, I was the manager, not the technical manager. So you managed a group of technical people? I did, sir, yes. Um, in 2002, you joined the POA security team. That's the post office account security team. Yes, and then in 2007, you became operations team manager in that team. Is that yes, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, briefly, what did the operations team manager role involve? It really managed the, uh, the team of three or four people in the security team who carried out various security processes and functions. Um, you say three or four. Are you able to assist us with their names? Um, Andy Dunks, uh, Naina Lowther, Bill Membry. Penny Thomas. Thank you. We're going to also hear from Miss Munro later today. Um, can you assist us with where you fit in with that line management? Um, I don't. I, I left ICL Fujitsu before Donna took over my role. So she took over your role? I believe so. Thank you. Um, uh, we're going to see the name Brian Pinder as well. Can you assist us with where he fit into things? Brian Pinder was my manager. He was the security manager, when um, one of the managers while I was in the security team. Thank you. The first document we're going to look at is This um, The seventh of set of December, I've said pre your time um, as team. Yep. Uh, at this. Yes, I was, I was doing various tasks for the manager. Um, and because I was a manager. So you were her manager at this time? Um, I, what, what date was it? This was 2005. I don't think I was, no. No. So we have your name, we have Brian Pinder's name, we have uh, Nena Lothar's name. Yep. So there are only three core yep. recipients, yep. and you're saying it's just for information? Well, information as far as I can see, uh, that was the, pretty much the security team, yes. Um, can we please look at the statement that she was attaching? That's FUJ 00122152. Uh, this is a template we've already seen a couple of days ago. Um, 
if we perhaps turn this is a slightly different Uh, with an earlier witness. And it has the following form of words about halfway down the page. It says, as follows. Um, I have asked that my faults Failures, equipment, and calls for and I think those question marks, did, did you understand those to be part of the pro forma that you would fill in? I, I think that's the dates that were inserted when somebody was filling in the witness statement. There were, and then X number of calls, and then that's the details, is it? Yes, looks like yes. it to me. Mm. Um, to the these calls relate to faults which would have had an effect on the integrity of. held on the system. And if we down over to page seven, please. That's zero zero. I have two. Of that document. to assist you with the words that are in that middle email. We'll just show you the part of the statement that that appears to be referring to. What you may mean by acceptable to I, I didn't. Um, can we look at FUJ 00122153? Thank you. And if we turn to page four, we can see. You'll recall, we, we just looked at Penny Thomas's email where she says she's removed it. Right. If we turn to page four, we can see that that form of words has been removed from this pro forma.
Can you see that? It's the second paragraph. Yes. Oh, please look at it. An email of the twenty sixth March two thousand and six, so you're not or an email that you're copied into. Was it part of, for example, Andy Dunks's uh, contract or standard working practice as far as you were aware? No, I think it was delegation. I don't think it was. Yeah, can you assist us at all with why it might have been that something like this was seen to be worthy of noting on going forward? No, it's, it's Brian. written that uh, um, he's obviously happy that uh, Andy could help him out with it look at it This is e That email. So it's the launch. Sent to Andy Dunks. Look at that on that. Page. You can see there's reference to Lord. paragraph right uh, and then that form of words that we saw originally taken out of penny thomas's statement still appears in this statement that was so Right. This email. Is 
instance where it just seems to Uh, do you recall who and what was post office? Was at the post office within Fujitsu. Are you able to assist us? Previously provided written responses. I would like to sound out the possibility of someone at Fujitsu providing a formal witness statement along the lines of the attachment below, which was provided by Bill Mitchell in one of our criminal cases. Um, who was Bill Mitchell? Bill Mitchell was the predecessor manager to Brian Pinder, security manager. Thank you. Uh, whilst Marine Drive and Torquay Road are not criminal matters, given the allegations being made by the postmasters, I'm sure you'll agree that it is very much in both ourselves and Fujitsu's interests to challenge the allegations and provide evidence that the system is not to blame for the losses being reported. Whilst it may not be a statement that you, Penny, or Nena can provide, I'm sure there must be someone who can. Um, just pausing there, yep. that concern uh, that it's in both ourselves and Fujitsu's interests um, to, to show that the system is not to blame for losses, was that a concern that you were aware of at that time? Uh, I was not aware of this, no. You, you, you weren't aware that that was a concern? Not, no, I didn't realise that, no. And then the paragraph below on a separate matter. I also require a witness statement in respect of the following ARQs, and he gives some ARQ numbers, all of which relate to Gerwin Sub Post Office. Uh, we need the usual uh, covering the analysis and gives a period. And he says, Penny, you may recall this one, which relates to nil transactions. My previous emails dated the 14th, 21st, and 25th of October refer. <coughs> if we scroll up to page five, please. Thank you very much. We can stop there. We now have an email from Mr. Ward to that Fujitsu general address, but now it's copied to you. Yep. And it says, Brian, Penny, Nena, uh, can I inquire when the Gerwin statement will be ready, please? Uh, bold paragraph below, as it is required for the submission of prosecution committal papers, uh, which have to be in by the end of the week. Yep. Also, have you made any progress in deciding whether a similar statement as to the one previously prepared by Bill Mitchell will be possible in the Torquay Road and Marine Drive cases if we require one? Um, can you assist us with why you were copied into that email? No. I think I was copied in a lot of things just to, just to make me aware, but uh, no, I had nothing to do with the statement. And is that because, because you're part of quite a small team? Yes, I think so. If we scroll up slightly, thank you very much. You're still copied into this email. You're copied in, yes. It's a response from Brian, and he says, uh, Graham, no problem. We're happy to provide a statement presenting the help desk calls regarding Marine Drive and Torquay Road. When required, grateful if you could provide us with a heads up nearer to the time. So that's answering, I think, the second of those questions in that email. It looks like it, yes. Um, could we please turn to the bottom of page three and into page four, please? Thank you. So we have here an email um, from... Graham Ward to Brian Pinder and others, but you're not copied in at this stage. 
although I think you did receive the, the chain and we'll, we'll come to look at that. But if we scroll down, please. So scroll down to the bottom of page three. So I think you might be scroll, need to scroll up. It's page three. Thank you. So it, it's the bottom email right. there from Graham Ward to Brian Pinder. As I say, you're not a direct recipient of that, although we'll look at the, the entire chain because I think you do possibly appear again. Um, it says as follows, Brian, I'll get back to you once I've confirmed whether we need these statements or not in respect of Torquay Road and Marine Drive. Uh, can I also take this opportunity to clarify our requirements in respect of the Gerwin statement? In this case, the sub-postmaster is blaming Horizon for his losses, claiming that for various banking-related transactions, the counter-desktop records amounts entered for payment, uh, but then shows nil when the transaction log is printed. And it is this we need to refute. Just pausing there, as at this period, so March 2006, were you aware of complaints being made by sub-postmasters uh, blaming Horizon for losses? No, sir. You, you weren't aware of that? No. Um, various emails passed between myself and your team on this matter. And the reply below was received from Penny on the 20th of October 2005. And then the next paragraph appears to be a quote from um, an email that had passed between himself and Penny Thomas. It says, nil transactions could also be caused by errors in pin pad, counter, agents or host code, depending on what constitutes a nil transaction. This cannot be determined without access to the appropriate system logs. And then he continues, Penny also sent, with the respective ARQ data, additional spreadsheets which showed all nil transactions for the periods. Uh, he, he says, we therefore require the usual statement producing the transaction and event logs. Penny has sent me a draft and I've suggested one or two minor amendments. Uh, we'll also need the above spreadsheets produced by whoever put them together explaining the headings and under what circumstances nil transactions can occur. Um, finally, one or two, um, etc. cetera. Um, the question I have for you is about the words from Graham in the second line. He says, Penny sent me a draft and I have suggested one or two minor amendments. Uh, was it usual, to your understanding, for a uh, somebody in the post office investigations team to suggest amendments to witness statements? I can't recall whether that was a, a true statement or not. I don't know. Uh, it's Graham Ward talking to Penny Thomas. Yes, but within your small team, you being copied into emails about witness statements, um, you having, we've seen, made some comments on witness statements. Very minor. Uh, Very minor. Were you not aware... I think you've, one, said that you weren't aware that sub-postmasters were blaming Horizon for losses. Yep. Uh, and two, is it your evidence that you weren't aware that the post office investigators um, inputted in some way? I don't know whether they did. I, I thought that was just advice, but uh, I don't know. Can we turn to the first page, please? Um, email from Nina Lothar, so within your team, to Gareth Jenkins. Yes. And she says, hi, Gareth. I've updated your witness statement with all the column headings you explained to me earlier. Um, I'm going to now take you to the witness statement that was attached to this email, and that's FUJ00122198. Um, so this was the Gareth Jenkins statement. Mm -hmm. If we could scroll down. 
that statement included a couple of paragraphs that we have seen with previous witnesses. Yes. If we have a look down the page. It's these two paragraphs. There's no reason to believe that the information in this statement is inaccurate because of the improper use of the computer. To the best of my knowledge and belief, at all material times, the computer was operating properly, or if not, any respect in which it was not operating properly or was out of operation uh, was not such as to affect the information held on it. <coughs> Did you have any concerns about those words being used in, in witness statements? I don't recall anything like that. This, this is a statement by Gareth Jenkins. Yes. Not from me. No, but you were a member of the small team. You were senior within that team. Yeah, I didn't involve myself with witness statements. Um, do you now have any concerns about those words? Today? Yes. Of course. Yes. Um, can we please look at FUJ 00122203? Um, we have a response from Gareth Jenkins, and I, I accept you're not copied into this email, um, but he says, I've annotated it with revisions. In particular, I don't feel I can include the last two paras, uh, which may make the statement useless. Um, do you not recall any discussion within your team about concerns about the accuracy of witness statements being no, provided? I don't recall my input into this at all, no. Uh, perhaps we can look at FUJ 0012203. Sorry, it's FUJ 0012201. And that's the statement that Mr. Jenkins has attached to this email. Thank you. And if we scroll down to the, the end of the statement, please. He's highlighted those two paragraphs mm -hmm. at the end. And he says at the bottom, I'm not sure that the, the yellow bit now, we've scanned it in in black and white, but it's those two paragraphs yep. there, yep. Uh, is true. Can this be deleted? All I've done is interpret the data in spreadsheets uh, that you have emailed me. Um, so looking back at what we've already looked at this morning, yes. um, we have Penny Thomas removing a definitive statement about system integrity from the pro forma that she had been working on. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Gareth Jenkins here expressing concerns about a paragraph that says that the uh, computer system was operating properly. Um, as at 2006, do you recall there being any concerns within your team about what they were being asked to do in relation to the provision of evidence in criminal proceedings? I don't recall anything like that. This is what the part of the job was, to provide a witness statement with the, with the figures from the ARQ. And you don't recall within that small team any discussions about concerns about the reliability of the evidence being given? No. I'm going to move on to a specific issue, and it's an issue that we might refer to as the Craig Park issue or Lock issue. Yes. Can we please have a look at FUJ 0015482.3, please? We're now in August 2008. So by this time, you are a manager of the team or the... Yes. Yes. Can you assist us with what management involved? Were there regular team meetings? Team meetings? Um... How often? Appraisals, objectives, um, typical manager type roles. How often would the team meetings take place? Uh, various, as, as and when necessary. If there was a, some sort of issue, there would be a team meeting. Um, otherwise, it'd be a routine, maybe a monthly meeting. And appraisals, feedback? Appraisals would be annually. Um, was it a team in which people who were in the team were able to speak freely about concerns that they had? I think so, yes. Let's look at this particular issue. Uh, we have here, if we turn to page, the final page, please, if we start at 
at the bottom of the email chain. An email from Mick Peach, 11th of August, 2008. Uh, Mick Peach, he was the SSC manager, was he? Yes, he was. Yes. Yes. Um, this is an email from him to Gareth Jenkins. You're not on this particular email, but you do appear in the chain, and we'll, we'll go to that email. Mm -hmm. um, but he says as follows, Gareth, OK. I understand that you don't want this to be left unfixed, and we can see in the subject it's about a particular problem in a branch, Craig Park branch. Uh, on the basis of the evidence that we have, there are 35 errors per week inside the 7 to 8 p.m. Wednesday window. Uh, Wednesday window is, is that the balancing day? No idea. No idea. Uh, and two in the 35, 52 weeks. Uh, equals 1,820 are known to have caused a discrepancy. A, SSC staff spending lots of time monitoring these events for one to two per year is simply not cost effective. B, fixing the underlying problem of holding the lock for too long is feasible, uh, and it refers to a peak, and we're going to go to that peak shortly. Mm -hmm. And he says, but... Uh, I, would not, I would want some assurance that making this change to the live estate to resolve two reported issues is not going to have a knock-on effect anywhere else. Uh, I know this is a difficult request, but I don't, think, I don't like changing Horizon at this stage, and I would like to be convinced that it is necessary and that it won't make matters worse. If we go up, please, to page three. Um, so summarising that, Mick Peach seems to not want a fix to Horizon um, and is looking at some workarounds. It looks like it, yes. 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 Gareth Jenkins responds to Mr Peach and he says, Mick, as discussed, I'm still uneasy um, about this, but I agree it's probably safer to leave things as they are. I've discussed this with Mike and I'll mention this to Pete Sewell so that he can ensure that if we're providing evidence for an ARQ, that we also check on relevant events. Um, now, your evidence so far has been that you didn't get involved in witness statements. Tried not to, yes. Um, well, why is Mr Jenkins there seeing you as the relevant person to go to in respect of providing evidence for an ARQ? I can only assume that's because uh, I was Penny's manager, Penny Thomas. And Penny Thomas was the ARQ expert. Um, so you managed the person. We can see that Gareth Jenkins emails you. And he says as follows, Pete, over the last couple of years, we've had a couple of cases where EOD, I think that stands for end of day. Yes, I believe yes. so. Uh, which runs at 7 p.m., interferes with transactions being written at the counter. If this happens, then there is an event written to the NT event log. Um, given we only have a couple of instances and a fix is as likely to cause further problems, then we're reluctant to make a change to Horizon. However, if Horizon data is being used in evidence for the prosecution of a postmaster, it is probably wise to also check to see if any such events were produced during the period in question. Is this something that can or should be built into the ARQ process? Um, and then if we look up, please, if we go up to the previous page, page two, we have an email from yourself following this up. Within, is that within your team to Alan Holmes and Penny Thomas? Yeah, Alan Holmes was the, I guess, the design authority for the audit system. Uh, and it says, Alan, can we set up a meeting, please? Gareth has raised a potential issue with events which might require a change in our ARQ process. Uh, so it seems as though, as at the 12th of August 2008, you were taking things forward, arranging a meeting about this issue that had been raised by Gareth Jenkins. That's exactly what that is, I think, yes. Yes. Can we please look at FUJ00155232, please? Uh, this is an email slightly before you've arranged that meeting. 
Mm -hmm. And you, it's a response to Gareth Jenkins, and you say as follows, Gareth, when you say interfere, are transactions actually lost when the end of day is run? Can you assist us with any information you received in that respect? Do you recall this conversation? No. No. I just don't recall it. Do you remember receiving an answer? No, don't recall it at all. No. I mean, you do seem there to be sufficiently involved that you are... I think I was with uh, Craig Park. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can we please look at FUJ00155231, please? Thank you. An email from Penny Thomas to Gareth Jenkins and others, including yourself. It says, hi all. Pete has asked me to send a note to set up a meeting to discuss this issue. And then you ask if everybody can make the 14th of August. And, and she attaches Peaks and Kells. So the Peak is the incident log, and the, no, the Kell is the known error log. Were those things that you were familiar with at that time? I know what they were, yes. 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 Um, so she's sending around effectively information to be discussed at a meeting. Yeah, these are the three technical people that would have had real relevant input into this. Yes. Thank you. If we look over to page four, please, that's the first of the peaks that she has attached. It's again a, a, a peak that we've seen quite a lot of over the past couple of days. It's PC015376. And it begins on the 20th of December 2007. Uh, so by the time of this discussion in, uh, I think we're in August now, um, August 2008. So by August, it had been known for eight months, this particular issue. Yep. Is that right? Uh, reading this, yes. 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 Um, presumably, prosecutions had been going on during this period and other court cases. I... I don't recall, not sure. Do you recall, for example, a pause in 2007 to August 2008 following this issue? Yes. You recall a, a pause in 2007, or do you recall a pause later? I recall there was a pause while yes. this was checked out. And that pause presumably followed the August meeting rather than I think, prior to the I August so, yes. meeting, because you weren't aware of it before I think so. this period. Yes. Um, so are we to understand that after discovery, 20th of December 2007, uh, up until the date of this meeting, there hadn't been, from your team at least, any significant impact on the work that was being I don't know out. whether things were being checked at that time or not. I, I don't recall. But uh, as manager of the team, do you recall any significant change to your practices between December 2007 and the date of the meeting in August 2008? I believe the error on Craig Park was 2007. Yes. Yeah. The error was in 2007. You are manager of a team that provides, for example, witness statements and prosecutions. Mm -hmm. Do you recall from December 2007 up until the date of this meeting in August 2008 any significant activity in relation to this issue? I don't recall. I don't recall. You don't recall or, or you don't believe there was any? I don't remember. I don't remember. It's, it's if we turn over the page to page six, please. I, I won't spend much time on this peak because we have, as I said, um, seen it a number of times here, but I can just summarize it for you. The middle of this page gives an indication of the issue. It says, the messages that should have been have posted the £465.73 gain in stock unit at BM to local suspense failed to be written. Consequently, when local suspense was cleared, written off to profit and loss in this case, the £465.73 wasn't taken into account, and this resulted in the minus £463.73 trading position seen on the branch trading statement. Uh, so it seems as though the issue is that the sub-postmaster's branch trading statement would show a discrepancy as a result of this error. Yeah, it was suggested, yes. 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 If we go over the page, please, to page 7, 
we've heard from Gerald Barnes. There's an entry here that we, again, as I say, have heard quite a lot about, and he says as follows. He says, the fact that the EPOS code is not resilient to errors is endemic. Uh, there seems little point fixing it uh, in this one particular case, because there'll be many others to catch you out. For example, when I tried to balance with CAB's process running, I found that declaring cash failed uh, with the same sort of error message. Uh, so the issue being here that there would be a discrepancy uh, and it wouldn't be showing as an error to the sub postmaster. Is that what you understood the issue to be? I, I don't understand this. This is Gerald Barnes. Yes. He's one of the technical guys in the, what was in the team of SSC. Uh, and he has summarized the issue in, in lay terms as effectively uh, an error that is silenced to the postmaster. Is that something that you were aware of, that this issue no. that caused a discrepancy wouldn't be seen, wouldn't be known to the sub-postmaster? I, I wouldn't know. I don't know. You, you wouldn't know? I don't know whether the postmaster was aware of this. Was that not something that was explained to you at the time? Explained to me? Yes. It wasn't explained to you? I don't know. I don't recall it. I don't recall? No. Um, I mean... Something that affected the balancing of a sub-postmaster, the branch trading statement, the statement that they would see that would show a discrepancy. Yes. Is that not something that would be of concern to you? Um, if I was involved at this level, yes, I guess so, but I wasn't. You were the manager of a team that well, provided evidence in yeah, prosecution of sub-postmasters. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I recall this at all. No. I mean, not resilient to errors, um, it suggests that, in fact, this is... Um, just an example of a problem that the underlying code could cause, rather than uh, the real problem being the EPOS code itself. Is that something that was ever discussed with you? No. no. Too, too detailed for me. No. I mean, during phase two of this inquiry, we heard quite a lot about the EPOS code. Uh, we heard about whack-a-mole type problems where something would be fixed, something else would come up. Um, you were at ICL at the time of the rollout. Was that a kind of issue that you knew anything about? No. That nobody discussed with you at the time? No. Can we please turn to page 11? This is the known error log. <coughs> If we could scroll down and over to the next page, please. We see the solution being explained. It says, no fix planned for Horizon, given the relative rarity of the problem. However, should the problem start occurring more often, then the need for a fix should be reviewed. Add any cases to the list below. And then we can see a list of cases. So there we have three, by that time, peaks that addressed so three recorded incidents that were sufficiently serious enough to result in an error log. Yes. 12th of December 2007, 5th of March 2008, 27th of December 2007. Over to the next page, please, we have... Uh, and can I just be clear? Those were just the reported errors that were sufficient to make it into an error log. Do you understand peaks to, to be something? No, uh, you're right. They're, yes. They're the, the, yes, they're the logs. Um, over the next page is another peak. So this one we're looking at PC0152421. And perhaps we could go over to page 15. Here we have Anne Chambers reporting on the 21st of December 2007. And the second entry in, in her entry says as follows. The stock unit uh, was being balanced at 7 p.m. at night. And at the point where the stock unit gain should have been written to local suspense, there was some contention with the end-of-day process, uh, which were running in the background, and the message, messages were not written. She says, at the branch, the loss for TP8... Uh, was £465.73 bigger than it should have been. 
Uh, the loss, £1,083.76, pence, was written off to profit and loss. Uh, as I understand it, this means the branch is not personally out of pocket uh, and there's no need to attempt to correct anything at the branch. Uh, the branch trading statement shows a trading position of minus £465.73. Pence. Um, there is then a meeting held, and I'd like to take you to a note of the meeting. That's at FUJ 00154824. So the meeting's held on the 13th of August 2008. Yeah. Uh, present in the room is Gareth Jenkins, Alan Holmes. Can you assist us? Gareth Jenkins and Alan Holmes, they were both technical specialists. Yes. Um, Steve Meek. Steve was, Meek was technical as well. Yes. And then we have Penny Thomas uh, and you joined by phone. Is there a particular reason why you joined by phone? Uh, I might have been away somewhere else, another location. I'm going to read to you a fair bit from these minutes before we take the mid-morning break. I'm going to start with that second paragraph. Um, Gareth Jenkins explained the issue as described in the Peaks and Kells listed above, and those are the documents we've just been looking at. Uh, an end-of-day process was being run between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m., and at the same time, the user was performing a balancing process on the Gateway PC. During the end-of-day operation, the cabs process created a lock on the message store, during which time, 30 seconds, causing any other messages uh, rights to wait, subject to a 10-second timeout until the lock was released. The balancing operation attempted to write messages to the message store, but this operation timed out and the messages were discarded. Due to a deficiency in the implementation of the counter code, the end user was not informed of the failure, and the transaction, the balancing operation, appeared to complete successfully. Um, so, in essence, the sub-postmaster wouldn't be aware uh, of the issue. I don't think so, no. Yes. When this type of error happens, Repost records an event in the event log. It was said that this type of error could happen with any type of transaction. He then quotes the words that we've already looked at from Mr. Barnes. Um, so the, the, the record of the minutes um, records those, uh, that detail. Uh, and then it goes on and says as follows. When this error condition occurs, the message is discarded and no gap is left in the message sequence numbers. Uh, the messages that fail to be written represent auditable events slash transactions. And this throws the credibility of the message sequence number uh, check used to, provide, to prove the integrity of data provided to the post office under the ARQ service. Uh, the question is, should any of these errant messages have been included in data returns and under what other circumstances could this type of failure arise? Pausing there, did you see as, this as, as a significant potential issue? Yes. Yes. It then goes on to say, the discussion then focused on the way forward it was agreed that we needed to understand what types of transactions have been subject to this error. Uh, to do this, we needed to retrieve all of event logs, filter the repost error messages, and analyze what was found. Only event logs from the 8th of January 2003 have been retained due to a previous retention agreement with the post office. Um, just stopping there, so because the data was only retained for a certain number of years, any for example, ARQ data from the rollout of Horizon, so 2000 to 2003, by this stage would no longer have been held. Yes, I think that's right. Yes. And over the page, at the same time, we needed to consolidate all of the ARQ outlet and time frame data requests into a single Excel spreadsheet so that ultimately any relevant errors found in the event logs above could be compared to ARQ data provided to the post office for litigation purposes to confirm the integrity of the data provided. Uh, this exercise can only be carried out from the 8th of January 2003 for the reasons that we've just explained. Yes. We cannot provide any further ARQs until this exercise is complete, as the audit server is being fully utilized, retrieving the five and a half years worth of event log data. 
So at this stage, five and a half years of data was being gathered for some sort of analysis. Yes, looks like it, yeah. Uh, we must question whether it's advisable to provide further ARQ data uh, or witness statements until we have a process in place to fully validate our returns. Uh, so do you remember some concern within the team at this time about witness statements and data that was being provided to the post office uh, and the reliability of that data? Yes, as a result of this, yes. 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 It was agreed that the process of retrieving all of the av available event logs would be carried out and would start immediately. A sample would be provided to Stephen to review. Also, the consolidation of the ARQ requests would commence. Uh, and that's a note of this meeting. We're going to come to what happened after that, after the mid-morning break. So, sir, if we could stop there for 15 minutes and return at quarter to 12, please. Certainly. Thank you very much. <coughs>
Sir, can you continue to see and hear me? I can, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Sewell, we're going to turn now to a meeting that took place in September of 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, can we please look at FUJ 00155257, please? It's a meeting that took place on the 3rd of September, and this is an email dated the 5th of September um, with some notes that followed. Sent to you by Roy Birkinshaw. Who was Roy Birkinshaw? Uh, I think one of the uh, managers in, in, in one of the teams. I don't quite remember his position. Um, draft statement there, peak 152376, triggered a review of the audit mechanism uh, and of the Horizon Counter's behaviour. Uh, this review has been going on over the last two weeks. Our conclusion is that there is not sufficient evidence to warrant continuing the review at the scale with which it was being conducted. There are nevertheless some residual actions that need to be driven forward. Um, are we to take it then that the significant exercise that had been planned, the five and a half years worth of ARQ data, um, it was decided on the 3rd of September that that wasn't um, there wasn't sufficient evidence to warrant continuing that kind of a review. I don't know. I don't recall that. I don't, I don't remember that. I mean, do you remember five and a half years' worth of ARQ data being poured over for a considerable period? That, or? that was one of the, the plans that was coming out of the remedy, but uh, whether it actually happened, I don't remember. Does this email suggest, in fact, that it didn't happen? If that's what that is referring to. Yes. Um, and then there are a number of actions for people. Uh, J Bay, J JB is somebody called John Burton. Is that a name that's familiar to you? Uh, the name is familiar, yes. Do you, know, do you know what his role was? No, I don't. No. Um, JB to review with Hillary over the extent to which the programme might need to revisit the history of ARQs that are closed. Um, number two, PS is presumably a reference to yourself. I think so. Audit and security teams to progress changes to the current process to tighten any weaknesses perceived therein in responding to open ARQs. If we look at number four, uh, PS, so again, your name, with assistance from the audit team to review the words currently offered to post office in support of ARQ requests and prosecutions in the light of the review run. Can you assist us there with the task that you had been set? Um, well, actually, what it says to review the words, I think the main word there is assistance from the audit team. I think they were the players who, who put the wording in. It says PS with assistance from the audit team, so it seems as though you were personally tasked with this. Maybe I was tasked, but then I delegated that down to the team that were relevant to putting the wording in. Um, so where the task involved, for example, um, reviewing the words currently offered, um, for example, in perhaps witness statements, that wasn't a, something that you yourself got involved in? Absolutely not. No. I relied on the technical people to put those words in despite being the named person there to carry Well, I think the, the named person is the person maybe who will make it happen. Can we please now look at FUJ 00155263? We're moving now to the 16th of September 2008. This is an email from Anne Chambers to Penny Thomas, but you are copied in alongside Copy. Gareth Jenkins. Yes. Presumably your evidence is that this was just because you were her manager or something along those so, lines? Yes. yes. Penny, we discussed this event when it occurred uh, while CAB's process was running at 7pm, but we didn't explain why it might be seen at other times. And if you were ever questioned about it, it might confuse you. Uh, basically, it happens when one process has locked the message store, usually only very briefly, and another process tries to access the message store at precisely the same time. The worst offender for doing the locking is CAB's process, but it can happen at other times too. Um, did you understand that the issue wasn't just at the, at the 7 p.m. time, um, but it could also happen at other times? Uh, the only thing I was aware of was the end of day process that seemed to affect it. 
And is, do, you, do you read this in the same way as I read it, which is that, in fact, it's not just the end-of-day process, it can happen at other times too? That's what it suggests here, doesn't it? Uh, and was that something that you were aware of? No, no. Uh, whether it causes a problem or not depends on, A, what the second process is trying to do, and, B, whether that process handles the error situation in a sensible way. All the checks we've made ha have shown that, in the vast majority of cases, what is being done has no financial impact and doesn't affect the integrity of the system in any way, and or the error situation is handled sensibly. Um, just pausing there, um, in the vast majority of cases, has no financial impact. Uh, as somebody whose team was providing evidence in court cases, um, do you think reference to vast majority of cases is reassuring or, or not reassuring? Uh, th this has been written by Anne Chambers, who was uh, Technical Design Authority. So, uh, I didn't ask who it was written by. Um, she refers there to it not affecting the vast majority of cases in respect of financial impact. Um, your team is providing witness evidence in proceedings against sub-postmasters. Mm -hmm. uh, is it reassuring to you to hear that it doesn't happen in the vast majority of cases, or would you like it to happen in no cases? Oh, obviously, no cases. That's, that's what the yes. choice is, yes. Uh, and were you aware at this stage that in some cases it could cause a financial impact? I wasn't aware. No. Um, if that happened, or something similar to this happened, in for example, a prosecution of a sub-postmaster mm -hmm. who wasn't aware of the issue happening uh, because there was no error notice provided to them, uh, might it result in a serious injustice to that sub-postmaster? I think it would, yes. Can we please turn to FUJ 0015-55265? Uh, Penny Thomas, to yourself. Pete, as an afterthought, what happened with regard to checking error, uh, event errors for cases we are not advised of? Was someone action to deal with this? Uh, was that a concern that you recall at all? I can't remember it. <laughs> because what Ms Thomas seems to be concerned about here is errors that you're not advised of need to be checked as well. Do you recall doing anything about that? I don't recall. I don't remember it. Putting aside the particular issue, do you remember at this period, September 2008, some significant task force uh, grouping together um, to have a look at all the historic cases, for example, at Fujitsu? The one thing I do remember is the, the lock-in issue with the end of day, um, and, and that was um, proven to be a, a bug in the system, which was corrected, and, and then the ARQs and the events were rechecked after that to prove that they were okay. And what she's expressing concern here is that there may be issues that you're not aware of, um, other subject, other event error checks. Did you instigate some grand task force to review? We checked event errors, yes. To check, yes. You, you checked all historical event errors, yes, all previous right, yes. Yes. court cases historically from, from that the period time when, that... When we knew the period of where the error was, yes. Uh, and when you say you knew the period the error was, I mean, we'll see in due course references to 2007 to 2008. That's the period. Um, it was, in fact, confined to that period, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Uh, and we saw earlier that the original intention had been to review historic cases for as long as you had records for, back, dating back to 2003. But it yes. seems, certainly by this stage, that that didn't take place, that wider exercise. Yeah, I don't remember, don't remember why it was not done. But, uh... Were you the person who was responsible, uh, if it had taken place, to have instigated it? I don't believe so, no. Who, who do you say should have instigated that? I don't know. Someone from the design authority of the audit system. Somebody from the design authority of the audit system? Yes. What do you mean by that? Who might that be? Maybe Alan Holmes. So a technical person? A technical person, yes. Not somebody who's directly involved in the team that is uh, assisting with the prosecution of sub-postmasters? Mm, I think one of the technical team should have taken it on, yes. Can we please look at FUJ 
Um, an email from Gareth Jenkins uh, to yourself, 8th of October. He says, Pete, I'm not sure I'm the best person to be checking through the ARQ events for Penny. Uh, I think it would be better if you arrange with Mick for SSC to do this as part of their normal activities. Presumably, they were doing this while I was on leave, but now that I'm back, Stephen has started sending them back to me. I'm happy to advise on specific questions, but I think SSC have a better detailed knowledge of what causes these events uh, and what are known uh, to be benign than I have. Uh, they also have processes in place to cover for leave, etc. It certainly seems as at the 8th of October 2008 that Gareth Jenkins saw you as the person who was responsible for coordinating, who, who was carrying out various checks. Uh, I'm not sure that's true. I, I, I'm not sure I'm the person, but uh, um, I think he's, he's going through me because I can then go back to SSC and maybe change it. So he saw you uh, as what? Uh, Postbox, uh, uh, well, ma manager of Penny, who was actually managing the check-in. Yes. Um, it says I think it would be better if you arranged with Mick for SSC to do this. Yes. Well, the Mick. suggestion being that you were doing the arranging. Is that not right? Yeah, it suggests it. Yes. Pardon? Suggests it. Yes. Sorry. Yes, it suggests that I was managing Penny. A and is that right or wrong? Well, I think. No, it doesn't suggest that you were managing Penny. Uh, the, the question was uh, about the second paragraph, and it was, I think it would be better if you arranged with Mick for SSC to do this. Um, it reads as though you were the one who was coordinating the response. It, were you coordinating or weren't you coordinating? Don't remember. Um, Gareth Jenkins is distinguished engineer. We've seen provided witness statements in proceedings. Um, he is saying there that the SSC have a better detailed knowledge of what causes these events uh, and what are known to be benign than he has. Uh, did that cause you any concern at all? Uh, not concern. I, I think he's probably valid in the fact that he was busy doing other things and the SSC had more of a um, more, more influence on what they could check. Um, but he says there that they have a better detailed knowledge of what causes the events. Well, the they, suggestion being that he wasn't uh, up to speed in some way as to what caused the events. Well, that's what he's saying. Um, the SSC were very technical. And, um, More technical than Mr Jenkins? That's a difficult question. Do you want to try and answer it? No. No? No. Okay. <laughs> Um, FUJ 00155270. We have here 10th of October 2008. Anne Chambers, Gareth Jenkins, and Penny Thomas. Um, she says, although Mick's line is very strongly that SSC should have no formal responsibility for checking events connected with ARQs, in the short term, he's happy for me to help with this on an informal basis, as I have been doing already. This may have to stop as SSC involvement with HNGX, that's Horizon Online, increases and will always be a low priority. Uh, Penny Thomas then emails you and says a cap in hand jobby. Um, can you assist us with what this might mean? Well, we needed help for the, for the analyst, uh, analysis of the events and uh, Anne Chambers would be the ideal person. Uh, and you, I think your evidence was that you weren't coordinating this particular um, process seemed to be emailed by Penny Thomas forwarding that email. Did, did Penny Thomas not think that you were the person who was coordinating the response? I don't know what that means, cap in hand jobby. No. Um, why do you think people didn't want this responsibility, didn't want to be carrying out this task? We've heard Gareth Jenkins not wanting to do it. We've now heard Anne Chambers happy to do it on an informal basis in the short term. Um, it, why do you think people were reluctant to get involved in that process? Well, the only thing I could say is they were, they were all quite busy with other things. Um, and it required a technical knowledge to go through the events to look for this. Uh, do you recall any concerns you had about the inability to have sufficient people checking what, what seemed like quite a serious matter? Well, I think we, we found the, the appropriate people and, that, and they did the job. 
Um, can we please look at FUJ 00155271, please? We're now moving to a proposed technical solution. Um, so we have all these people carrying out checks that we've had a look at, uh, but we're now moving on to a change proposal, a formal change proposal. Do you, did you understand what a change proposal was? Yes, yes I did. Can you briefly explain to us what, what that might be, a change proposal? When uh, the, the, the project decided it would be a change to the way the things were being done, it would formally be done via a change proposal which specified what the action was and why it was being done. And we have the email from Alan Holmes to yourself and others. Gents, as discussed last week, I've put the attached together as a proposed Horizon Online change proposal to handle the processing of counter events within audit. Uh, any initial comments? But do you recall that the, the plan was for Horizon Online to automate the process that was being undertaken? Um, In time, yes. 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 Let's have a look at the attachment to that email. That can be found at FUJ 00155272. Um, we see there HNGX, that's Horizon Online, change proposal. Date raised the 13th of October 2008. Um, and it has you named there as the change owner. Um, is that correct? I think it was because I was the manager in the, um, the, the particular sort of work. Um, I mean, that's quite a responsibility, isn't, isn't it? I think it's default because it was a security thing. Um, so is your evidence that you were or weren't significantly involved in this change proposal? Um, significantly involved insofar as I knew what was going on and I bought into it, yes. How high up within the company would this proposal have been seen? Would depend on what the change was, how important it was. Um, so you as the change owner here, uh, would you have raised it with people who managed you? Yes, my manager would have been involved, so, yes. So who would you have raised it with? Uh, 2010, I think that would be Howard Pritchard. 2008. 2008. Um, I think it was Howard Pritchard still. I think it was still pretty sure. And is the purpose of a document like this to ultimately share it with the post office? Uh, the ultimate is to cost out what this is going to cost and agree to it with all parties that are involved. It's and the counterparty being the post office? I don't remember the post office being involved with this CP, no. Um, well, if we look at the very top, we have Fujitsu's logo, we have the post office's logo. It is a change proposal to uh, the Horizon system, presumably this is a document that you are preparing for the post office? No, it's an internal document. It's a change proposal to our existing systems. So was the intention for this document to always be an internal document that wasn't seen by the post office? Um, I just think it's an internal document for ICL. <laughs> I'm going to read to you from the document. The second substantive paragraph there says, historically, the Horizon Audit Service has relied solely on the retrieval and analysis of archived repost message store data when servicing the post office audit data requests for Horizon branch transaction data. A recent issue, and that refers to the peak incident log that we have seen this morning, has identified a deficiency in this approach. In certain failure scenarios, it is possible that the Horizon counter may write an inconsistent set of messages to the local message store. This casts doubt over the overall integrity uh, of the resulting transaction data. Thank you. If we could have a look at the paragraph below that. It says a tact about halfway through that paragraph, it says a tactical solution has been incorporated into the Horizon audit retrieval process to provide a short-term remedy to this problem. Uh, for every branch repost data retrieval, 
the archived events generated by counters at the branch are also analysed to identify any possible occurrences of problems which might adversely affect the integrity of the transaction data. Um, so having identified the problem, the process that was being undertaken prior to the change uh, was a manual solution um, that, as it explains there, um, remedies the problem. Checking the events, yes. Checking the events. Yes. Could we please have a look below that? Thank you very much. Um, it then highlights deficiencies with the current solution. It says it is a largely manual process which is error prone and time consuming. Is that something that you are aware of, that the process that was being undertaken up until the change is made uh, was <coughs> error prone? I don't know about that. I, I, didn't, uh, I wasn't aware there was an error prone. It, it meant it was a manual exercise. Any manual exercise contains risk. You say you don't know about that. I mean, this is a document that was sent to you. Everything we did was to check the events without, um, without finding errors. This is a document that was sent to you of which you are the owner. Mm -hmm. It describes the process as error prone. Is that something that you were aware of? Well, I think you have to be, because it's a manual process, yes. It says it is moving large volumes of data between the audit server and workstation. I think we've seen that that in itself carries risks, because it's taking something from a server to uh, a workstation. It, some, keeping data such as that on a workstation is itself inherently problematic. There is a risk, of course, yes. yes. Uh, it requires local and insecure storage of event audit data, invalidating certain statements made within the current witness statement. Um, again, something you would have been aware of. Yes. That, there, that the process invalidated certain statements that have been made in witness statements. Um, it has no DR mechanism in the event of DR, and, and gives a reference there. Are you able to uh, assist us with that, or is that too technical? That's uh, no. That's the disaster recovery mechanism, with, the, with the disaster recovery side, Lewis. Um, could we please go over the page? It says, whilst we believe that we have to live with this tactical solution for the remaining life of the Horizon audit system, a permanent solution for the Horizon Online audit solution is required, which addresses the above deficiencies. And then it sets out some requirements. Under the final heading on that page, reason for change and justification for required date, it says, while we do not believe that due to time constraints it's practicable to introduce this change into Horizon, it is required to ensure the viability of the ongoing prosecution support service within Horizon Online. Um, so it seems to be that there wasn't sufficient time or perhaps sufficient I think we've heard some evidence about it, it costing a lot to introduce into Horizon, what we know as Legacy Horizon, um, and it was instead going to be introduced when the new system is implemented. Yes, that's right. Yes. Would you agree with the cost issue as well as time? Or Well, that was a major player in this, yes, the cost of, of introducing it into the Legacy system, yes. yes. And if we go over the page, please. I mean, just, just pausing there, though, with the time constraints and the cost constraints, people were, during this period, being prosecuted or there were court cases that were going on relating to the Horizon system. Uh, it might be asked why it wasn't seen as a sufficient priority in those circumstances. To introduce it into the earlier release? Yes. A, a the cost, a the resource availability, and this would have to be accepted by the project, the post office project internally, for this to go be accepted. And we feel the board, it went through, through a change control board, would probably not have accepted it. And if, as we've seen, the process that was being undertaken in the interim period was error prone, uh, as I say, if there were court cases that were ongoing, why do you think it was not seen as that significant a priority? There was attached to it because it was a bit of a manual process. Um, it was just important that this was carried out successfully. 
Yes, and why do you think a more reliable solution couldn't have been implemented earlier? For cost, for cost as much as resource availability, and I think it would have put the whole HNGX proposals push back. Thank you. Um, consequences if not approved. We are obliged to present and vouch for the integrity of audit data that is fit for purpose, i.e. admissible as evidence in court. If this change is not approved, we will need to continue operating the current Horizon tactical process for the lifetime of Horizon Online. This raises the following issues. Uh, we're liable to service penalty payments if we cannot provide dependable audit data and witness statements when requested by the post office. There is a risk of prosecution support sus service suspension if there is any interruption to the current tactical process. Uh, will require ongoing allocation of resource, and it's to insert the number of man days per month, uh, to operate the current tactical process. And then it says data integrity issues inherent with the current process needs to be addressed by weakening the content of the witness statement. Uh, were you aware that data integrity issues that were inherent with the process that was ongoing needed to be addressed by weakening the content of the witness statement? Only by reading these words. They're not my words. That wasn't a concern of yours at the time? I was concerned with uh, overall getting the thing through and uh, ensuring that our vents were checked prior to going HNGX. Um, can we please look at FUJ 00155276? Thank you. If we look at the bottom email, there is seems to have been a meeting on the 15th of October, um, and it says this is a follow-up to today's meeting, minutes of which are roughly below. So it provides the minutes of the meeting of the 15th of October uh, from somebody called um, Steve Evans. Who was Steve Evans? Uh, I think he was a technical person from SSC. Uh, and he says there, towards the bottom, he says... Um, however, the real cost of this development, or rather of not doing it, is the potential for mistakes, especially by a new resource without the experience of SM, uh, to be made in a manual process which uses data so far abstracted from the original source, uh, which is the proposed new wording for the CP. If we scroll up, please. Oh, sorry, uh, up. Thank you. Um, we have Alan Holmes sending a, a new version of the change proposal uh, to yourself and others. And he says, as discussed at the last meeting, uh, I have watered down the proposed change proposal, copy attached. Uh, are you able to assist us with what was meant by watered down? I don't recall. I don't recall. Um, the change proposal appears on the next page. So if we could go to page two, please. This is the version that he described as watered down. Um, could I ask for it to be brought up side by side with the earlier version, which is FUJ And it should be the first page of that document. 55272. Thank you very much. Um, so that's the earlier version on the right-hand side uh, and the watered-down version on the left-hand side. Um, we see there at the bottom, on the left-hand side, it now says uh, the current Horizon tactical solution is, largely, is a largely manual process the operation of which is reliant on a few key individuals. Whilst we believe that we will have to live with a tactical solution for the remaining life of the Horizon audit system, a permanent solution for the Horizon online audit solution is required. In outline, this will require the following. Um, what has been removed from this version, we can see on the right-hand side, is the number of deficiencies that were identified on the right-hand side. So the reference to, for example, the manual process being error-prone does not appear 
on this watered down version. Do you see that? Yes. If we, on the left hand side, turn to page four, please. And on the right hand side, turn to page three. We have their consequences if not approved. Now, we saw on the right-hand side um, reference to, for example, that that final bullet point in the first box, data integrity issues inherent with the current process need to be addressed by weakening the content of the witness statement. Uh, that no longer um, is included in the watered-down version on the left-hand side. It says, instead, we are obliged to present and vouch for the integrity of audit data that is fit for purpose, i.e. admissible as evidence in court. If this change is not approved, we will need to continue operating the current horizon tactical process for the lifetime of HNGX. So data integrity issues inherent with the current process no longer appears. Do you recall discussion at this meeting about watering down that version on the right-hand side? Uh, no, no, that's the design authority that's decided to do that. When you say that that's a design authority, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, Alan Holmes. Alan Holmes. He, he, so we saw on the front, if we stick with the left-hand side perhaps, and look at page two on the left-hand side, the one on the right-hand side can come away. We have Alan Holmes there as the originator, but we have yourself as the change owner. Mm -hmm. uh, are we to understand from your evidence that despite being the change owner, um, that wasn't something that was discussed with you? I would listen to the technical sponsor, the originator, the same person. And if that was their wording, I would go along with it. Um, Mr. Sewell, your evidence so far about witness statements, for example, was I didn't look at witness statements, I wasn't involved in them. Um, your evidence about the change proposal, of which you're named as the change owner, mm -hmm. is effectively I would have just seen what those with greater knowledge did. Uh, I would have approved it. Um, some people might be struggling to understand quite what you did. W what did you see as your role? If not to get involved in things like witness statements, or if not to get involved in something where you are named as the change owner. I relied on other people with the technical knowledge to give me the advice. You may have relied on other people, but don't you think as manager of your team, the team that was assisting with the prosecution of sub-postmaster, do you not think that you should have been more involved in the detail? Uh, I'm the change owner here. I'm not the originator of this CP. Change owner by because I was in the security team and it's a security change proposal. Um, if we look at the covering emails, so that's on page one, there are very few people who are involved in this. There is a meeting, meeting after meeting taking place about this issue. Um, you're named there uh, as a senior individual, um, as a recipient from Mr. Holmes circulating a document that was discussed at the last meeting, do you not think that you should have played more of a role in this significant issue? I, I played a role in the, in the issue. Do you not think that you should have got down into the detail of what was going on, given your team's role with regard to the prosecution of sub-postmasters? My detailed knowledge was limited, so I, I couldn't get any more involved than I did. But you had seen documents that relate to concerns about the integrity of the data. Mm -hmm. Should you not have been more concerned? I would always listen to the technical authority to advise me. You may have always listened to people, um, but people may be asking why you weren't doing more about it. What, what do you mean by that? Well, you've seen, for example, concerns about data integrity. Yes. You are managing a team that provides witness statements in criminal prosecutions and civil claims against sub-postmasters. 
Uh, why weren't you raising this at the highest levels? Why weren't you getting more involved in resolving the issues and ensuring the integrity of the data that Fujitsu were providing to the court that led to people's prosecutions? This was at the highest level. This is Alan Holmes, the design authority for the audit system. Uh, are there no higher levels within Fujitsu in the United Kingdom? I guess there would have been, yes. Yeah, so Alan Holmes was the highest, highest level, as far as you were concerned, that this was being raised with? Regarding the audit system, yes. And you didn't see it as your job, as the person managing the team that was involved in criminal prosecutions, to do anything more than you were doing? I did what was necessary. And what was necessary? I uh, listened to Alan Holmes and took his recommendations. And that was the limits of your job, was it? Regarding the audit, yes. On this occasion, yes. Can we please look at FUJ 0015 55278? Twenty fourth of October two thousand and eight. There seems to be another meeting. This is from Penny Thomas. She says, I believe this is from Penny Thomas, her name's at the top. It certainly is recorded there from somebody. It says, at today's meeting, uh, Pete agreed that with Alan and Roy's input, we urgently need to thrash out the words to sell the CP to interested parties. Now, she doesn't say Alan agreed. It's, she says Pete agreed, or whoever recorded this says Pete agreed. It does seem, from the contemporaneous documents, that you were more involved, perhaps, than your evidence today is suggesting. Well, I'm the sponsor that wanted to see that the CP was approved, so that would be my interest. So now you're involved because you're the sponsor, well, but before, when we were looking at drafts, you weren't involved because you were just the change, the, the change uh, owner. Well, change owner, sorry, I didn't mean sponsor, change owner. Uh, that was my responsibility. So you weren't significantly involved to actually get into the detail of the no. change proposal that we've just seen, but you were significantly involved enough uh, to have agreed that you need to thrash out the words to sell the change proposal to interested parties. Is that right? Yes. How could you have formed that view if you weren't involved in the detail of the change proposal itself? Because the wording would be put together from... As so we said here, Alan and Roy's input, and I would then take that CP to the board. You were at meetings where the change proposal was discussed. There was a version that raised issues with data integrity. There was then a decision to water down that version. Uh, you were present at those meetings. You were uh, receiving the various drafts. Uh, and you here say that you urgently need to thrash out the words uh, to sell that proposal to interested parties. Surely you were more involved uh, and knowledgeable about the words that we've looked at today than your evidence today is suggesting. I offered whatever I could. Um, these, these words are not mine. We urgently need to thrash out. It's, it's correct, but it wasn't labelled onto me. Yes. It's, it's, it's the people who put the words in. But you want to sell a proposal... Uh, that your evidence is suggesting you weren't to the change board to ensure that we got the board to approve it. And was your intention to approach the board in ignorance of the history of that change proposal, in ignorance of, for example, concerns that were raised in earlier versions uh, about system integrity? That was taken out. I indeed. Do you think that you were well placed to address that board? of that. Qualified to question what the design authority said. So you would take whatever the design authority uh, suggested to you and, and try without knowledge, despite having been in those various meetings? Yes. Can we please look at FUJ 00155... Sorry, Mr. Blake, yes. just so that I'm clear, that last document uses the phrase interested parties in terms of to whom it is to be sold. Can I be clear what your understanding of interested parties is, Mr Sewell? These parties were relevant people who the CP would normally affect with regard to resourcing or costing uh, or effect on the business side. Yeah, but, but 
that's uh, generality. In this particular case, could you identify who they might be? Are they departments of Fujitsu? Are they the board of Fujitsu? Are they the post office or what? No, they would be working managers that form the board of, of the CP board. Um, right, so all Fujitsu people? Yes, yes, sir. Right. Fine, all right. Can we please look at FUJ 0015537, please? Thank you, I think. Thank you very much. Um, we have there from Penny Thomas, 26th of November 2008. Um, she says, attached my precy with Alan's comments plus a standard ARQ form. If we turn over the page, it is a document that we have looked at, although we haven't looked at it with the various comments in it. Um, just to be clear, you are named on the first page as a required attendee of this meeting on the 26th of November 2008. Um, could we please look at that first section, the audit system and ARQ service? There is a reference there um, in the second bullet point. Um, it, it just says as follows. It says, the completeness of data extracts provided is assumed and witness statements state as much. And there's a comment there from Mr. Holmes. He says, uh, it is more than assumed, or at least so we thought. The repost sequence numbers are checked for gaps, and from this we assert that the extract shows a true and complete representation of what happened at branch. Um, if we scroll down, please, under problem, if we look at the fourth bullet point, it says, uh, the statements currently Asserted statements in cannot be guaranteed in all cases, even after this change proposal. It says, see example on last page. Uh, the words example on, and we'll see the words reliably, are added in this document. Um, but this change proposal seeks to strengthen the process and allow us to reliably in identify uh, where the assertion can or cannot be made. Um, so it, it was known at this stage, it seems, that there were concerns about not just a particular paragraph in a witness statement, but in witness statements plural, uh, because the words change there are the words example on. Do, do you see that? Yes. Uh, wasn't that a serious issue then, that if the witness statements uh, currently uh, couldn't be guaranteed? The accuracy of those witness statements couldn't be guaranteed. I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, I mean, we've seen you tasked earlier with reviewing things such as witness statements. I think your evidence was you were named, but it was people underneath you. That is correct. Um, but as the named individual who was responsible for reviewing historic or previous witness statements, um, does that not cause you some concern at the time? I didn't review any witness statements. You were named as being responsible for the review of witness statements. As somebody who was named um, as responsible for the review of witness statements, does that cause you or did that cause you any concern? At the time, I don't remember. I don't remember. Does that cause you concern now? It's too long ago for me to remember. I don't remember. I can't ask you to remember, uh, but the fact that there are witness statements that, that had been used that couldn't be guaranteed. Does that cause you some concern? Today, yes, it sounds, yes. sounds alarming. Um, if we go over, to, please, to page four, there's the attachment of the standard witness statement. And that's a document that we've already seen, but if we scroll over, scroll down, over the page, into the next page, We keep on going, please. Thank you very much. And into this next page, we see there the words that I have already, uh, that I started with today. Uh, the integrity of audit data is guaranteed at all times from its original origination, storage, and retrieval to subsequent dispatch to the requester. 
uh, controls have been established that provide assurances to post office internal audit that integrity is maintained. Those aren't actually the words that I took you to earlier. That, these are other words, but they've been highlighted in red, presumably as some sort of concern. Uh, and you'll see another significant passage that I have taken you to highlighted in red. That's on page 10. Uh, and those are the words, there is no reason to believe that the information in this statement is inaccurate because of the improper use of the computer. To the best of my knowledge and belief, at all material times, the computer was operating properly, or if not, any respect in which it was not operating properly or was out of operation was not such as to affect the information held on it. Um, that has been highlighted in red uh, and is circulated prior to this meeting on the 26th of November 2008. Um, those are the same words that, as we saw, Gareth Jenkins expressed a concern about in relation to uh, his use uh, of those sentences. Okay. Do you recall having a concern about the use of that passage at this time? I don't recall. No. As somebody who was in charge of the team mm -hmm. that was assisting with criminal prosecutions, uh, do you think that you, it should be perhaps more prominent in your memory? Uh, this is 15, 16 years ago. No, not for me. No, not given everything that's happened with Horizon. I haven't seen some of these documents for many years. Don't, don't bring back any recollections at all? No. no. Can I now turn to FUJ 0015537 We're now in December 2008, 1st of December. An email from Penny Thomas to yourself. Um, please find attached my weekly report. So it seems as though she is sharing with you a weekly report. As you'll see, no work has been undertaken in the audit room this week uh, as a result of the ARQ OLA uh, may again be breached uh, as a result of my absence from the office. So it seems as though she wasn't in the office that week. Um, but she says as follows, also, as a result of Steve Evans and Alan Holmes' note concerning the audit CP and the witness statement content, I do not believe we should send any further witness, standard witness statements until we have the chance to discuss what was said last week and the implications. I currently have three outstanding. Um, so she, at that stage, raises quite serious concerns uh, about the content of witness statements uh, arising from this issue. Yes. Uh, and this isn't something that you recall? Uh, I would think that's got something to do with the manual exercise that was going on, the manual check-in of events. It, it followed the meeting where the note is circulated about the audit CP uh, and the witness statement with the red highlighting that we've just been looking at, it follows that being circulated. Um, was this not a matter that needed to be brought to uh, the attention of very senior people within Fujitsu? I don't remember whether it did or not. That, that wasn't a remember question. Mm. That was a question about whether it should or shouldn't have been. Uh, the question is, given that Penny Thomas is expressing concern about witness statements that were being used in criminal proceedings and civil proceedings. Um, should that not have been a matter uh, to have raised at the very highest levels of your company? I think the concern was with the witness statement and what he was saying. Yes, and my question was about whether it should have been raised at senior levels within your company. I don't recall. It's not a recollection question. It's a question about whether you now, looking at it, oh, now? think yes. that it should have been raised. Yes, maybe. Yes. More, more publicity on it, yes. And in terms of your recollection, do you remember whether it was or wasn't raised? I don't recall. Yes. Um, you're being asked by the stenographer just to speak up slightly. Sorry. Please. Sorry. If you could just repeat. I think he said, uh, I do not recall. Um, can we please bring up onto screen FUJ 00155378, please? I'm going to start with the very bottom 
email, same day, 1st of December 2008. Um, from yourself to Howard Pritchard. Um, can you remind us who Howard Pritchard was? Was the security manager. Uh, Howard, some brief words, uh, and this is entitled ARQ service problem. Uh, the problem first raised in SI has been fully investigated by SI, audit and SSC. Uh, the real problems I can see is the overhead in the event checking and pennies statement, which contractually is now incorrect. Um, you, you seem to describe there to Mr. Pritchard that Penny's statement is contractually incorrect. What do you mean by contractually is now incorrect? I don't remember. I don't remember what that means. I mean, a, an incorrect witness statement is not simply a contractual problem, is it? It's a more significant problem than that, isn't it? It's probably relating to the wording. Yes. Yeah. And the use of incorrect wording, for example, in criminal proceedings, that would be a very serious matter indeed, isn't it? Yes. And why were you there describing it as, in effect, a contractual problem rather than a real-life problem affecting people's lives? The choice of words was probably wrong. Um, it may be a choice of words. Does it imply uh, some degree of seriousness in that you didn't see it as a uh, serious problem affecting people's lives, you saw it as more of a business problem, a contractual problem? I think it was the words, but I don't remember it that well. If we could scroll up slightly, please. Thank you to that email above. Penny Thomas to yourself. Hi Pete, is the change proposal uh, now in the system? It must be stressed that the current process for event checking is not an acceptable procedure. We need to consider what to do with regards to witness statements already provided. One, when the case has not yet gone to court, and two, when the case has gone to court. The identification of one may well result in questions seeking the viability of two. Um, so she seems to raise a very serious concern there about witness statements having been provided already in court proceedings. Uh, and insofar as there are cases that haven't gone to court, if it's raised, that in itself could raise questions uh, about cases that have already gone to court. Did you not see that as a serious issue to be dealt with? I don't recall. I don't recall it. You don't recall that? No. Was it not significant enough in your memory to recall? No. A concern by a person who had been providing witness statements in court proceedings raising concerns about the accuracy of those statements? Yes, I don't, rem I don't remember what the action was from it. So. Um, do you remember concerns? I mean, you had a very small team. Penny Thomas was somebody you managed. Mm -hmm. Do you not remember her expressing concerns to you about witness statements that she had provided. Well, this, this EP, the CP says that. The, uh... Yes, but do you not remember it? You were managing her, you were having team meetings, you were having feedback sessions, you had appraisals. I don't remember individual things. No, I don't. I don't. Could we please scroll up? Howard Pritchard, to yourself. I'm going to need you to interpret this particular email. He says, Pete, as the ISMR, uh, the change proposal was discussed and it was agreed. Can you just assess us? What, what is ISMR? I can't remember. No? I can't remember. Uh, was discussed and it was agreed that the content will need to be rewritten as there are possible conflict, dot, 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 i.e. potential dot, dot, dot. This will be rejected by the board. Please rewrite the change proposal and, if required, speak to Hillary to get further wording so that it can be accepted as soon. Um, can you please assist us with the language that is being used here? There seems to be some issue that he won't perhaps commit to writing. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Um. The content will need to be rewritten as there are possible conflict, i.e. potential Potential what? I don't know, sir. Um, did you email him back and say, what are those dots? What, what do you mean by that? He, he seems to assume that you know what he would be talking about there. Mm. Well, I don't. 
was there something so bad that was unspeakable that couldn't be put into writing? Not that I was aware of, no. Can we please now look at FUJ 0015538? Uh, we're now on the 11th of December 2008. Um, an email from Penny Thomas. Uh, you are a recipient of this email. Proposed slides for ARQ service issue. Uh, and she says there, please find attached proposed slides for presentation to Wendy. Um, can you assist us with who Wendy was? Wendy was the um, director of the project. Now we're going to look at those slides. Um, in, in a moment. I'm just going to take you uh, to a further email before we do that, and that is at FUJ 0015483. Thank you. So those slides, the original slides having been circulated on the 11th of December, uh, by the 15th there was, uh, they had been altered slightly. Um, this email you're included as well. Um, yes. Now, it's a little difficult to read this email because there are words that Penny Thomas has quoted from uh, Graham Allen's email below, uh, and there is her response to those questions. Um, so, starting with that first substantive paragraph, um, he says, Graham Allen says, do we need to add um, the last point on slide two, that although we know of no instance where we will uh, not get an error, which will indicate indicate incompleteness, we cannot guarantee this. And her response is, Tivoli event data is known to be incomplete, uh, viz turn off TECs during event storms, gaps in the event sequences generated by OMDB. Uh, there are occasional corrupt records uh, within the event audit tracks. Um, he then asks, he also asks, do we need to add something about if we find a gap uh, we do not know what to do about this. If we do say this, uh, we'll need to say that we're doing what we're doing to progress a solution to this, or what the options are to tell the post office that we can't provide data. And she says, added to slide five, and we'll come to look at slide five, or the new slide five. Um, and then he comments on slide three. I think the second point should say prone to human error. I'm presuming if we automated this, uh, the error indicated in this point would be removed. And she says, it's not just human error. The process is not secure. But yes, that's my belief. Partially automating will remove this point. Slide three, why does the change proposal not suggest full automation, or does it automate as much as possible, in which case um, it should probably be worked like that, worded like that. And she said, we cannot fully automate. We'll always need someone to check unfiltered errors. Um, and then she attaches the amended presentation and says, please let me know if I haven't fully covered uh, your comments or if any others have been identified. And I'd like to take you to the presentation. <coughs> which is behind that. So if we just go over the page and on to page three, please. So there is a PowerPoint presentation. If we scroll up, please. It's prosecution support, urgent issue. Do you, do you recall this PowerPoint presentation? Yes, I think so. Yes, you recall that there was going to be this meeting with Wendy and that this was a presentation to be made to her. Yes, I'm not sure I was at the meeting, but uh, yes. If we scroll down, please, the first substantive slide, ARQ service audit system. Um, concerns being addressed here. Uh, the completeness of data was underwritten by our witness statement. Uh, counter problems, peak, and it's a reference to that peak that we looked at, the fact that EPOS code is not resilient to errors is endemic. Mm -hmm. It says we're manually cross-checking with available event data, but completeness is still not guaranteed. Go over the page, please. A manual and proposed process. Manual process is onerous and must be reviewed. It's error prone, so we again see that 
phrase that was ultimately taken out of the change proposal. Yes. It's error prone and time consuming. It involves moving large volumes of data between the audit server and workstation. It requires local and insecure storage of event audit data, invalidating certain statements made within the current witness statement. If we go over the page, please. Immediate issue, uh, witness statements and court attendance. A current standard witness statement is now incorrect. We guarantee completeness and integrity in that. Is your understanding of that, that in, in the pro forma witness statement that we've seen quite a lot of, um, Fujitsu or the author guarantees completeness and integrity of the data? Yes. Yes. Um, um, over the page, please. Associated issues. Uh, historic and current data has proven to be incomplete. Ramifications of historical data provisions. Uh, Fujitsu reputation. Wasn't this uh, the moment to have a fundamental rethink of Fujitsu's assistance in respect of prosecuting people based on Fujitsu data? Uh, you're asking me that question? Yes. Well, you were the manager of the team that provided all these witness statements. Um, we're reading here a PowerPoint presentation that is prepared internally, uh, which raises concerns about, in fact, it says current standard witness statement is now incorrect. Knowledge, corporate knowledge, that the current standard witness statement was incorrect. Was this not a time to have a real hard think about the way that Fujitsu went about its assistance to the post office? Uh, I think it is. Now let's look at it now. Yes. At the time, this went to senior management of the project. Is your evidence then that, yes, now, reflecting on this, that was the moment, but at the time it, it wasn't, didn't seem to be as significant as it now seems? Or I, I don't really remember my views on it then. No, but if it was seen as significant, presumably you would remember. No, it was a long time ago. Um, so even something that led to or could be associated with the prosecution, conviction imprisonment of a sub-postmaster uh, because of an incorrect witness statement, might that have been a significant event in your life? It would have been, and I didn't realise it at the time. Um, can we please look at FUJ 00155389? This is an email from Penny Thomas to you and others. Um, she says, Anne's comments need to be part of our discussion tomorrow. Um, and that's comments of Anne Chambers. And if we scroll down, we can see um, subject, new witness statement request support. And Anne Chambers has provided some comments to Penny Thomas and to Gareth Jenkins, which are forwarded to you and others. Um, she says as follows. She says, when such long periods are covered, especially at branches with many counters, there are almost certainly going to be some events which look alarming, but are, as far as I'm concerned, not particularly unusual over the estate as a whole. We wouldn't normally investigate them unless there were some grounds for thinking they had caused a problem, maybe because the postmaster queried something or something showed up on the reconciliation stream. Uh, just pausing there, knowing that there was an issue uh, that... Um, wouldn't be recognised by the sub-postmaster because there wasn't an error message coming up on their screen. Um, do you think that it is sufficient to rely on the postmaster to have identified a problem? Not necessarily, if he didn't know about it. Yes. And she continues to say, trying to justify and assess them so long afterwards without knowing what, or what the problem was is not feasible. While I'm happy to help out with this in the short term, I think I'm being pulled much further into this than I should be. Uh, so someone's going to have to work out what security's approach to this is. In the meantime, perhaps we should just continue to check the lock events, since those are the ones which need to have been proved to be associated with a financial problem in a handful of cases. 
Uh, were you aware uh, of concerns on the part of Anne Chambers um, in, in respect of what was being asked of her? I wasn't aware of this email, no. no. I mean, it was sent to you if we look at the top. Anne's comments need to be part of our discussion tomorrow. Do you recall any significant discussion? I don't. But there are a number of names on there. Yes. Um, can we look at FUJ00155398? Sorry, it's 394. FUJ 00155394. And it's the first page. And it says as follows um, it's from, from yourself to who's David Hind? I don't remember. David, the slides were presented to Steve Denham on behalf of uh, Wendy Wednesday afternoon. He's now aware of the problem and is going to talk with legal. In the meantime, we will be progressing with the change proposal. Uh, so it seems as though uh, Wendy wasn't available or didn't attend. Did you recall what happened? No. No? No. Uh, and Steve Denham received that PowerPoint presentation. He he, I think he was the customer services director. Thank you. Can we please look now at FUJ 00155399? I'm just going to take you to two documents before we break for lunch. We're now in January of 2009, um, and Wendy Wareham sends a message. If we look at the top email from Penny Thomas to Dave Posnett, she says, please find attached notes sent by my senior management this morning. Uh, we need to discuss urgently. <coughs> and if we scroll down, we can see that note. Um, this is a note being sent from Wendy Wareham to people at the post office, so to counterparts at the post office. Are you aware of any of those names at all? Uh, yes, yes, sir. yes. Penny Thomas appears to be concerned by the contents of this. Um, she says as follows, Sue, I have left you a voicemail as I need to update you on a recent issue that has occurred and been resolved, but does have some short-term impacts. In summary, the issue is as follows. In December 2007, an occurrence was reported in one office where a stock unit rollover coincided with the end of day process running. This led to a previously unseen database lock where an administrative balancing transaction failed to be written to the local message store database. This generated a generic and non-specific software error event uh, which went unnoticed in the monitoring of events. A financial imbalance was evident and was subject to investigation by Fujitsu's Service Support Center and Post Office Limited. The financial imbalance has been resolved. Uh, software correction was applied across the estate in early November 2008 to ensure that any such event generated would be monitored. Testing, testing of that correction has established that the unmonitored error does not occur elsewhere in the system. So just pausing there, this seems to be um, a senior level um, email from Fujitsu to the post office informing them of the problem that we've been looking at for much of today. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, the event occurred in December 2007, but it's taken until the 7th of January 2009 to provide that high level confirmation.
Do, do you agree with that? Yes. 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 Um, impact. We need to work with the post office to recheck the ARQs and reconfirm the data integrity during the period of May 2007 to November 2008. Penny will do this. Uh, so now we're looking at m a much shorter period. I think we discussed this earlier today. We were originally looking at a review of five and a half years' worth of data, but by this stage, it seemed as though the period for checking was just May 2007 to November 2008. Yes. Yes. Um, we need to discuss how we disclose uh, the issue on witness statements, and we have some words which may be appropriate. Uh, both need to discuss and agree the words. Uh, identify which witness statement we have supplied and are still awaiting uh, court to confirm whether or not the data provided was May 2007 to November 2008 to A, ensure events have been checked, and B, to recall and replace witness statements and it says poll slash penny, so the post office or penny seems to be tasked with that particular yes, task. Yes, we work together on it, yes. Further action, uh, automate the message store alerts on the system so that no manual intervention is required. A change proposal has been raised for this work. Uh, education to ensure this type of incident is raised as a major incident in the security stack. Uh, so that we can communicate and manage this in accordance with incident timescales. Apologies that this has not been communicated earlier, uh, but the review of security incidents should improve this issue. And, uh, the impression that's given by this email it is very much that it was a once-off incident from 2007. Do, would you agree with that? I, I would, yes. Yes. Um, there's no mention of, um, for example, Gerald Barnes's concerns we saw in that peak of wider problems with the coding, for example. Yeah, but I don't understand Gerald Barnes's uh, level of detail. No, but uh, there is no mention in this notification of wider concerns uh, of issues that may affect um, sub-postmasters without the sub-postmasters realising, for example. Yeah, well, <coughs> I don't really know. I think Wendy's talking about this particular issue. Uh, focusing on the 2007 incident, yes, sir. Uh, there's no mention of the kinds of wider concerns uh, that we have been discussing today. Not in this, no. Um, why did Fujitsu hang on to uh, it from 2007 to 2009 before having this high-level discussion with the post office? I think there was a, a fair period of time when, um, when nobody actually knew what the problem was, and it took a fair bit of investigation to find it. Uh, and was it standard for Fujitsu to wait until they had worked out and come up with a solution to notify the post office, rather than keeping the post office uh, abreast of what was going on throughout? Um, in this case, yes, this is what happened. Um, did you personally see it as important to protect the name of Fujitsu? Not really. I think it was more concerned to find out what the problem was. Um, but your general approach to your work, did you see it as important to your work to protect the name of Fujitsu? To protect the ARQ service. Not protect Fujitsu's overall reputation? I think it was more to find out what the problem was with the ARQ. Um, but my question is, did you see it as important to your work to protect the name of Fujitsu? Um, I guess I did, um, but not, not purposely. Not? Not a purposely trying to protect Fujitsu's name. What, what do you mean by that? Um, I was really concerned with finding out what the, where the error was and what it was and how we'd correct it. So you, it would be unfair to describe you as somebody who saw protecting Fujitsu as important, uh, an important part of their job? We will protect our own companies, yes. Um, one final document before the break. If we go to FUJ 0015475000, but this is an email um, to your, from yourself to Andy Dunks. Uh, and it relates to the Lee Castleton trial. That's yep. a case that we've seen a lot of uh, in this inquiry. Um, see you in court then. 
Uh, Fetters Lane is where they used to hang people out to dry. I don't suppose that type of thing happens anymore, though. Uh, that Castleton is a nasty chap uh, and will be out to rubbish the Fujitsu name. It's up to you to maintain absolute strength and integrity, no matter what the prosecution will throw at you. Uh, we will be behind you, hoping you come through unscathed. Bless you. Is that typical of your approach to the work that you were doing? No. No. I don't know why that was written. D does that help explain some of the work that I don't know we've seen today? I don't know why it was written. I don't remember writing it, but obviously I did. But uh, certainly don't understand it. So might that be an appropriate moment to break for lunch? I don't have that many questions. I have... I would say 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. There will be some questions from core participants. Um, the next witness won't be longer than one hour, I'm told. So we will finish comfortably today. All right, very good. So we'll begin again at, what, 2 o'clock? 2 o'clock. Yeah, fine. Thank you very much.
top of page one, please. And if we can highlight the top of page one, I'd be grateful. We see here there's a reply from you, isn't there, Mr. Sewell? To Andy Dunk, yes. Uh, and it's copied to Mr. Budd, isn't it? Yes. And you say, Bill, your statement is fine, and all you can actually say, if they stump up the cash, the counter equipment can, won't, I think can't, that might be can't, won't be much use, as the 42 days retainer of the message store is long gone and will be endorsed by Gareth, Pete. You were signing off what Mr Budd had already said in evidence, weren't you? I was trying to reply to, to him. You were giving him assurance that it was appropriate for him to go on and give evidence, weren't you? That's all I knew, that the, the message still would run. That's and in before. fact, what you were doing was commenting on a line that was being taken by the defence in evidence in this case, weren't you? Um, I don't know about that. And here, I think you were suggesting, in fact, that Mr Jenkins, if it was necessary, then he would be able to give evidence to provide a fuller picture. Is that fair? No, I think I was asking that Gareth would underline what I was saying, so I was correct. So he, he would endorse... What I was saying. ...what you were saying. Yes. Thank you. I don't think I have any further questions for you, Mr Sue. Is that it? That is, so. Uh, yes. Well, thank you, Mr Sewell, for coming to give evidence today. Um, we, we've got one more witness, uh, Mr Blake. We do, so. yes. Could we take our mid afternoon break now, so 15 minutes, so that arrangements can be put in place for Miss Munro um, to take her place in, in the room? So that will be yeah. quarter to three. Certainly. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you very much. May we please call Ms Munro? Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. I do solemnly, I do solemnly, sincerely and truly, sincerely and truly, declare and affirm, declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the and truth. Nothing but the truth. Could you confirm your full name, please, Ms Munro? Yep, Donna Maria Munro. Thank you for coming to the inquiry to assist it in its work. As you know, I will be asking you questions on behalf of the inquiry. You should have in front of you a hard copy of a witness statement in your name in a bundle at tab A1, and it is dated the 29th of December 2023. Do you have that? I do. If you could turn to page 12 of that, please. Yep. Do you have a copy with a visible signature? I do, yes. Is that your signature? It is. Are the contents of your statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. For the purposes of the transcript, the reference for Ms Munro's statement is WITN 068-50100. I will not be asking you about every aspect of the statement that you have provided, which will be published on the inquiry's website in due course. I will instead be asking about certain specific issues which are addressed in them. Based on the documents you have seen, is it right that you think you must have started working for Fujitsu Services Limited by at least December 2000? Yes, that's correct. And your first role with Fujitsu was as a technician in the Royal Mail Group account team of the Systems Management Centre, is that right? That's correct. You were part of the team that was responsible for monitoring the rollout of the Horizon system through the management of calls from post office branches in relation to the remote upgrades deployed to Horizon counters, is that right? That's correct. And that involved ensuring that Horizon counters in specific offices were deployed or rolled back on Yes. You say at paragraph six of your statement that if any issue arose, you would refer to a known error log, the software support centre, or the management system support to resolve the issue. Yes. Do you recall the kind of issues which were being reported to you time? Um, I don't recall the detail of the issues, no. Um, specifically, I remember when we were doing the rollouts that if we hadn't got every counter in an office with the software upgrade, it had to all be rolled back before their start of business day the following morning. Voice up a little bit so that the subscriber can hear you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Is it right that you recall the architects of the Horizon system, Ian Bowen and Glenn Stevens, assisting with the team's technical knowledge and understanding of the solutions used for issues raised? Yes, I'm not sure that they were specifically the architects of the Horizon system, but as part of part of it, so not so the whole system. I'm taking that wording from your statement. Yeah. It, you mean that part of the system? But they were architects of part of the system, not the whole system. You became a team leader in the systems management centre, is that right? That's correct. And then uh, left the RMG account team to support different projects across the Fujitsu business? Yes. In June 2000, Nine, you were offered the role of security operations manager in Fujitsu's post office account team, is that right? Right. You say at paragraph nine of your statement that you did not have much experience within security at the start of your role, and you raised this with the post office account manager, Peter Thompson, is that right? That's correct. And he, as chief information security officer, offered support throughout your role. They did, yeah. 
You say in your statement that the Chief Information Security Officer role was held by a number of individuals across the time you were with the Post Office account, um, including Tom Lily White, Howard Pritchard, and Bred Warren. Is yes. that right? You say that on joining the Post Office account, your main focus was on gaining an understanding of how the teams worked. Yep, that's correct. And you reviewed a number of services provide by the, provided by the security team, is that right? I did. And that included reconciliation services. Can you explain, please, what reconciliation services were? That's where they um, take the reports from overnight where uh, transactions haven't settled correctly and they reconcile against the reports to the different reports to, to which transactions were correct or incorrect and needed additional work. Were you ever involved in the work of the Reconciliation Services team as opposed to reviewing the service? No. One aspect of the security team's work was the litigation support service which was offered to the post office, wasn't it? Correct. You say at paragraph 13 of your statement that you were also responsible for the management of the security team, including sickness, leave, and performance monitoring, and workload distributions. Correct. You say at paragraph 14 of your statement that in your day-to-day -day work, you reported directly to Peter Thompson. Is that right? That's correct. And you also maintained a working relationship with the CISO and would reach out to him with questions relating to the more technical and security matters of the work of the security team. Yes. From 2012, your focus moved to supporting the payment card mm. industry data security standards compliance program, is that right? That is correct. Although you say you still had oversight of the security team at that time. Yes. Is it right that you left Fujitsu in 2015? That's correct. When you were security operations manager, you line managed Penny Thomas, is that right? That's correct. You describe her at paragraph 17 of your statement as the subject matter expert responsible for the management and carrying out of the extraction of audit. Yes. She was responsible for the provision of the litigation support service and supported the reconciliation service, is that right? She did. And Penny Thomas was supported in this role by Andy Dunks when you joined the post office account, is that right? That's correct. And Raj Binder Baines joined the team a few months later. She did, yes. You say in your statement she was supported as and when necessary, that is Penny Thomas, by the Software Support Centre, including Anne Chambers, as well as by Gareth Jenkins, is that yes. right? You say at paragraph 21 of your statement that you believe Gareth Jenkins was a senior solution architect for the Horizon system. You say he assisted Penny Thomas in understanding the ARQ data she retrieved as part of the litigation support service, is that right? Correct. You say you had fairly limited dealings with Gareth Jenkins and that you saw him on rare occasion briefly saying hello around the office, is that right? That's correct. But your understanding from these limited dealings was that he was on occasion called as an expert witness in prosecutions conducted by the post office? Yes. You say at paragraph 20 of your statement that it was Penny Thomas who provided training to Andy Dunks and Raj Binder Baines with training in all areas of the litigation support service and reconciliation service, is that right? Yes. And the aim of this was that the litigation support service and reconciliation service would continue to function even if the, a member of the team was absent? Yes. Do you mean by this that absent Penny Thomas passing on her knowledge to others, the litigation support service and reconciliation service would struggle to function? Sorry, can you reword that for me? If Penny Thomas was the one who was not there, without her passing on her knowledge, 
is what you're saying, that those services would have struggled to function? Yes. In terms of the work of the team extracting ARQ data, you deal with this at paragraph 25 of your statement. Could we have that on screen, please? It is page 8 of WITN 0685010. of the ARQ extraction work, you say this. At a high level, I was aware of the process the team carried out to extract ARQ data. The team worked in a secure room to access the audit servers via the audit workstation and would extract the ARQ data requested by poll. If required, the team would produce a corresponding witness statement in respect of how the ARQ data was gathered. The team were responsible for providing the ARQ data and witness statements to poll. If required, they could also be asked to present this evidence at court. I understood that the extraction of ARQ data was a contractual requirement of Fujitsu's relationship with Pol. Is it right that you yourself did not have any role in the extraction of ARQ data? That's correct. You deal with your line management relationship with Penny Thomas at paragraph 19 of your statement. Could we have that on, please, on screen, please? It's page six. And you say this, in the day-to-day -day performance of her role, Penny Thomas reported to the PO account manager and the CISO rather than to me. As her line manager, I was copied into some of Penny Thomas's email correspondence so that I could understand and manage the resourcing levels and capacity of the team. Penny Thomas also liaised directly with Paul in the performance of her role as their direct point of contact for the litigation support service. From memory and review of the documentation, Penny Thomas would occasionally copy me into email correspondence with Paul so that I had visibility of her capacity. Penny Thomas would only reach out to me for assistance in relation to the litigation support service for things like arranging cover when she was away as I managed the team workloads. I do not recall Penny Thomas raising concerns relating to the service itself as these would normally be raised with the PO account manager or CISO. I did not offer subject matter support to the litigation support service. You also say at paragraph 26 of your statement that you had no role in the provision of witness statements or, or the legal proceedings which followed the extraction of ARQ data. Correct. Is it right that your evidence is that where issues related to litigation support needed to be escalated, they were escalated to the post office account manager and the chief information security officer? That's correct. Can we have on screen, please, FUJ 00172047? This is an email chain from June 2010. If we can go please to page five of this document, we can see the first email in the chain, which is dated the 23rd of June 2010. We may have different page numbering by the looks of things at page five. <coughs> Apologies, that's entirely my fault. Uh, the reference, if we can try that again, is FUJ. Zero 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 nine seven zero four seven. There, that's it. We've got there towards the bottom.
that's the page we're after. The email at the bottom there, from Penny Thomas, 23rd of June, 2010. This is an email from uh, Penny Thomas to Graham Welsh um, and to you, as well as Peter Thompson. Um, it is copied to Gareth Jenkins and Alan Holmes. Uh, Peter Thompson, who you say was the post office account manager at the time, is that right? That's correct. The subject is duplication of transaction records on ARQ returns. And Ms Thomas attaches an initial report on the problem. You say in your statement at paragraph 34 that this is when you were first notified of the issue, is that right? That's correct. You are a recipient of the next email in the chain as well, which appears on the previous page, page four. That is also from Penny Thomas and provides an update to her note sent the day before. It provides some analysis showing that there were 112 ARQs affected by the issue in question, and there is a breakdown of that figure. And Ms <coughs> Thomas goes on to say that, the, that audit development were currently working on a fix, which is expected to be available Tuesday 29th of June. She then sets out a proposed explanation for the post office, which had been provided by Gareth Jenkins. And his proposed explanation was this. With horizon counters, the mechanism by which data is audited has always worked on the principle that it is acceptable to audit the same data more than once, in particular if in doubt as to whether or not it has been previously audited successfully. The mechanism used on Horizon to retrieve the data took this into account and only presented one instance of such duplicate data in the ARQ of that extracts. However, it has recently been noticed that the HNGX retrieval mechanism does not remove such duplicates, and a quick scan of the ARQs provided to Post Office Limited since the change to the new system indicates that about 35% of the ARQs might contain some duplicate data. A peak has been raised to remove such duplicate data in the future. However, until the fix is developed, tested and deployed, there is a possibility that data is duplicated. The reliable way to identify a duplicate transaction is to use the NUM attribute that is used to generate the unique sequence numbers. Unfortunately, this attribute is not currently included in the Excel version of the ARQ data that has been passed to Post Office Limited in the past. This will be included in all future ARQs until the problem is fixed. Meanwhile, all that can be done on existing ARQs is look for transactions that appear to be duplicates. Note that we have identified a scenario with postal services transactions where multiple identical mail items are accepted, i.e. the quantify quantity button is set to greater than one, but postage labels are printed for each individual item. This results in separate transactions being generated for each item which are identical in the ARQ extracts. There is another minor difference in the raw data apart from the num attribute, but this different attribute is not currently included in the ARQ extract. Do you recall this issue being raised with you now? Now I recall the issue um, since I have referred to the documentation, yes. Could we have on screen, please, FUJ 0009736. This is another email chain from June 2010. You are copied into one email, which forwards on to you two further emails. Could we go, please, to page four of the document? Here we have an email from Penny Thomas to Graham Welsh, which is copied to you. 
The email is dated the 23rd of June 2010, and the subject is duplication of transaction records. In it, Ms. Thomas asks whether Mr. Welsh can spare a few minutes to discuss the issue. The first of the two emails forwarded to you is on page five of this document. Could we go over the page, please? It is an email from earlier in the day on the 23rd of June 2010 from Penny Thomas to Pat Lywood, who appears from the emails um, on the page before to have been a service implementation manager. Do you remember her now? Yes. Ms. Thomas says this, hi Pat, we have, ha we have a very significant problem which has been recorded in peak PC 0200468. In a nutshell, the HNGX application is not removing duplicate transactions, which may have been recorded twice on the audit server, and they are appearing in the ARQ returns. For the old Horizon application repost, automatically removed duplicate entries. An initial analysis shows that one third of all ARQ returns since the new application has been in play have duplicated transactions. Also, we have a peak, which would highlight any duplication of records. This obviously isn't happening now. The reply from Pat Lywood is on the previous page. Page four, please. Starting about halfway down that page. Penny, I will add to CS prayers that your chances of getting it fixed before R2 is deployed are not good. Can I suggest that you explain the urgency to Graham and get him to raise it at management prayers? Can you also add a business impact to the peak using the impact button? Adam, please can you get your guys to take a look at this and let me know where the fix might be? Cheers, Pat. So Ms. Thomas was, uh, if we can scroll up please to the top of the page, Ms. Thomas was bringing you into the loop, copying you in here, into her email to Graham, in her email to Graham Welsh, sending on those two previous emails. This was potentially a very significant problem, wasn't it? Yes. On its face, there might be duplicate entries on ARQ spreadsheets, which had been provided to the post office. Correct. And at least some of those ARQs for, were for use in court. I believe so. Would you have discussed the substance of this issue with Ms Thomas? No. Why not? Because she would have already taken it up to the relevant senior management. Do you recall being concerned about this issue at the time? Yeah, I think we were all concerned about the issue. Hence why Penny raised it as urgent, um, but I don't recall any f detail around the issue in depth. Can we have on screen please FUJ 0012293? This is an email chain from July 2010. The top email is from Penny Thomas to you among another number of other recipients, including Graham Welsh, Gareth Jenkins, and Tom Lillywhite. Mr. Lillywhite was, I think you have said, the Chief Information Security Officer. He was. It is dated the 7th of July 2010. Ms. Thomas says this, forwarding on the email chain below. Please see response from Paul. The suggestion here is that Gareth completes all witness statements. This doesn't fit into the current SLA and really isn't feasible as far as I can see. Just pausing there, SLA, what does that stand for? Service level agreement. I attach a standard witness statement with modifications for duplicate transactions which Gareth has already reviewed. Guy, I'm not sure where you are working from today. Could you fit in a conference call at any time today? Kind regards, Penny. The email she was forwarding 
scrolling down please, was from Mark Dinsdale from the post office, 7th of July 2010. It says this, Penny, as discussed, our legal team in principle are happy with this and have agreed that if yourselves provide a witness statement covering your explanation below and additionally the following points, then the work around gets the green light. Juliet suggested the additional points to cover include what are we doing about it and over what period did this anomaly occur, i.e. upon migration to HNGX. She also suggested that the witness statement be completed by Gareth Jenkins, your expert witness. Ms. Thomas attached a standard witness statement which had been modified for duplicate transactions for the duplicate transactions issue. Do you recall there being a standard Fujitsu witness statement which was used by litigation support? I recall they had a template, yes. Could we have on screen, please, the statement which was attached to Ms. Thomas's email? It's FUJ001. 22904. The statement is in the name of Penelope and Thomas. It is a standard statement and therefore undated. The introductory paragraph says this. I have been employed by Fujitsu Services, post office account, formerly ICL Pathway Limited since 20th, 20th of January 2004, as an information technology security analyst responsible for audit data extractions and IT security. I have working knowledge of the computer system known as Horizon, which is a computerized accounting system used by Post Office Limited. I am authorized by Fujitsu Services to undertake extractions of audit archive data and to obtain information regarding system transactions recorded on the Horizon system. Then follows an overview of the Horizon system. Scrolling down slowly, please. And going over two pages to page three. There is a paragraph dealing with audit to um, with audit information. An audit of all information handled by the TMS is taken daily by being all new messages to archive media. This creates a record of all completed outlet transaction details, including its origin, outlet encounter, when it happened, who caused it to happen, and the outcome. The TMS journal is maintained at each of the Fujitsu Services data center sites and is created by securely replicating all completed transaction records that occurred in every outlet. They therefore provide the ability to compare the audit track record of the same transaction recorded in two places to verify that systems were operating correctly. Records of all transactions are written to audit archive media. We can see three new paragraphs, scrolling down a little please, dealing with the duplicate transactions issue, which read as follows. With horizon counters, the mechanism by which data is audited has always worked on the principle that it is acceptable to audit the same data more than once. In particular, if in doubt as to whether or not it has previously been previously audited successfully. The mechanism used on Horizon to retrieve the data took this into account and only presented one instance of such duplicate data in the ARQ extracts. In January 2010, a new HNGX application was introduced to filter transaction records for presentation to Post Office Limited. It has recently been noticed in this HNGX retrieval mechanism does not remove such duplicates. An enhancement to the extraction tool set will be developed tested and deployed and will remove such duplicate data in the future. However, until this enhancement is deployed, there is a possibility that data is duplicated. The reliable way to identify a duplicate transaction is to use the NUM attribute that is used to generate the unique sequence numbers. This will be included in all future transaction record returns until the retrieval mechanism is enhanced. A semi-automated process to copy the return data 
and then to identify and remove any duplicated records which may be present from this copy by using the NUM attribute has been agreed with the Post Office, with Post Office Limited for use in the interim period. It is emphasised that the duplication of audited records has not in any way affected actual physical transactions recorded on any counter at any outlet. The duplication of records has occurred during the auditing process when records were in the process of being recorded purely for audit purposes from the correspondence servers to the audit servers. Then going please to page seven of this document. The penultimate paragraph on this page says this. There is no reason to believe that the information in this statement is inaccurate because of the improper use of the system. To the best of my knowledge and belief at all material times, the system was operating properly, or if not, in any respect in which it was not operating properly or was out of operation, operation was not such as to affect the information held within it. This draft standard witness statement was circulated on the 7th of July 2010, as we've just seen from the relevant emails. Could we have on screen, please, FUJ 00225719? Before we look through this document here, do you remember receiving and reading the draft statement circulated by Ms Thomas with that proposed wording? No, I don't recall receiving or reading it. Would you, having seen that email chain, have read the statement that was attached to the email which you were copied into? I would if, I was, if it was sent to me direct, not as a copy. Starting about halfway down the page here is an email from Penny Thomas dated the 8th of September 2010 to Andy Dunks, copied to you. The subject line is Kirkuswold, ARQ PO48 to PO58. And it reads, it reads as follows, Andy, as you know, these returns are reruns of work you have already completed. Three out of the 12 of your returns contained duplicate transactions. All, 48 to 59, need to be represented on one disk. They are due in court on <coughs> the 20th of September. We have to get them to Salford, and they in turn have to relay to the investigator, so we need to get them in the post today. In order to get these out as quickly as possible, I asked Raj to rerun them for you. If you really are unhappy to take ownership of the work she has completed on your behalf, please could you rerun them yourself? Raj, can you show the fast ALQ process, which is really not onerous at all? You will then need to update your witness statement. The disk statement need to be in the post today, please. Kind, regard, kind regards, Penny. Going back, please, to the start of this This is an email dated the 6th of September 2010 from Ms. Baines to Mr. Dunks, copied to Penny Thomas. So you're not copied on this email, but it is forwarded on to you. And it says this, Hi Andy, just spoken to Maureen and the data for Kirkuswold needs to be resent as this had duplicated data. I have reran the reports for you, so please can you check and get these sent to poll. Also, I understand that these all also require the witness statements as well, so please can you get this done, as we will need to get this out ASAP, as this will be going to court on the 20th of September. Also, do you know where the PGP files were for the set of reports that you produced originally, as they need to be copied over to the NAS, and we cannot locate them on the D drive? Could these be on your desktop? Many thanks, Raj. So it appears that an ARQ return that contained duplicated data in September 2010 
and Miss Baines was asking Mr Dunks to check it. Is that a fair reading of that email? Yeah, she was asking him to check what she had retrieved and prepare it ready to be sent off, yes. Going to the top of the page, please. There is an email from Ms Baines which says this. Penny, Andy has checked the information on the disc, but with regards to the witness statement mentioned that I would need to compile this as I have ran the retrievals off. Please advise whether I would need to do this. And just scrolling up a little, we can see that this email was sent on the 7th of September 2010. Going up further to the page, the page to the email you were copied into, in that email that you're copied into, Ms. Thomas was effectively saying, it seems, that it should be Mr. Dunks who provided the witness statement and not Ms. Baines. Correct. Is that right? Why do you think you were copied into this email? Because I was the line manager of Mr. Dunks and Raj. And so you were copied in uh, in, in respect of the allocation of the work? or of the work. In, For what reason? So... If I recall correctly, it's in the allocation of work to make sure that the work be done in the timescales and also in concerns around um, Mr Dunks not wanting to pull off the work, do the work that was requested. In general terms, is it right that it was either Ms Thomas or Mr Dunks who provided witness statements when they were needed for court? That's correct. Could we have on screen, please, FUJ 001 This is an email from Penny Thomas to Tom Lillywhite and to you, dated the 4th of August 2009. It simply says, we are back in business, exclamation mark, and forwards on the email from Penny Thomas to Mark Dinsdale below. That's Mark Dinsdale of the post office. And that email of the 4th of August says, Mark, I'm pleased to report that following the deployment of R2, we have re-retrieved a selection of transaction records where duplicate transactions were previously identified. These records have been checked and we can confirm dupl duplicates are not now present. We will start retrieving records for ARQ requests and will do so in accordance with your priorities. Can you help with what Ms Thomas meant by being back in business? We stopped retrieving the ARQ requests while we were waiting for the, um, the fix to go in for the duplicate transactions. Could we have on screen please FUJ 001 22961? This is an email chain from September 2010, starting with the email about halfway down the page. This is from Penny Thomas to Andy Dunks and is dated the 10th of September 2010. The subject is the Crown and Wendy buffery. It says this, Andy, I have prepared a witness statement for you. Please read it through to make sure it's correct, all in capitals. It's saved in your witness statement, WS Drive. I will download the transaction records for you. You are not copied into this email, but you were brought into the loop on this case earlier in the chain by Ms. Thomas. We can see this over the page, please. The second email down.
Penny Thomas to Andy Dunks, copied to you, 10th of September. And it says, hi, Andy, see mail string. Could you please represent the ARQs and provide a covering statement today? If so, I'll confirm to Paul. I'll let you have a copy of my statement. Again, can you help with why you were being copied in? Just from a, a, a management perspective, to awareness of what work Andy needed to do so that he wasn't taken off to do something else. We have the draft statement which Ms Thomas sent to Mr Dunks. Could we have that on screen, please? It's FUJ 001 22958. On the face of the first page, it appears similar to the standard statement we looked at earlier, doesn't it? It does. But looking through this statement, if we can just scroll down page one. And page two. And page three. Stopping there, please. We see the paragraph on archive media there. And we don't see the draft paragraphs which were in the uh, July 2010 proposed statement that Penny Thomas was circulating. Do you remember the three paragraphs which were underlined in her July draft relating to the duplicate transactions issue? Obviously, events had moved on by this point, um, but, but the, it doesn't appear, does there, to be a reference here to that duplicate transactions issue having occurred. Is that right? Just That's scrolling great. down if you need to to look. And then at the bottom of page three, we have when information relating to individual transactions is requested, the data is extracted from the audit archive media via the audit workstations. Information is presented in exactly the same way as the data held in the archive, although it can be filtered depending upon the type of information requested. The integrity of data retrieved for audit purposes is guaranteed at all times from the point of gathering, storage and retrieval, subsequent dispatch to the requester. Controls have been established that provide assurances to post office internal audit that this integrity is maintained. Going over the page, please. And then during audit data extractions, the following controls apply. And then there are a number of uh, controls that are listed there. There's no mention in that paragraph either of any past issues with duplication of transactions in the ARQ data, is there? No. And going over to page five. The ARQs in the specific case are addressed. Scrolling down. And then over the page to page six, please. Going down to the bottom, please, the penultimate paragraph. We have the paragraph, there is no reason to believe that the system in this statement is inaccurate because of the improper use of the system. To the best of my knowledge and belief, at all material times, the system was operating properly, or if not in any respect in which it was not operating properly or was out of operation was not such as to affect the information held within it. Were you aware at the time that the form of words addressing duplicate transactions had not been included in any form in the standard statement in September 2010? No, it wasn't. 
Had you been aware, do you think you might have queried it? I think I'd have queried why we'd removed it, yes. Were you aware that a paragraph had been and continued to be included in the standard form statement, saying there was no reason to believe that the information in the statement was inaccurate because of the improper use of the system? And for all material times the system was operating properly, or the rest of that sentence? My understanding was that that statement is in regards to the audit workstations where they retrieve the data from rather than the integrity of the horizon system itself. I Given what you knew at the time about the duplicate transactions issue, would you have had any concern with the paragraph that we've just read out? at all or not, for the reason you've just said? I wouldn't for the reason I've just said, because it, I believe that was related to the workstations that they, how they pulled the data off, rather than the Horizon system itself. That can come down, thank you. There is just one further topic I would like to ask you about. Could we have on screen, please, POL 0002838? These are notes from a meeting in 2010, which was held to discuss a bug called the Receipts and Payments Mismatch Bug. Gareth Jenkins and John Simkins are listed as being in attendance. First of all, were you ever told about this issue, the Receipts and Payments Mismatch issue? No. The issue is addressed under the heading, what is the issue? Discrepancies showing at the horizon counter disappear when the branch follows certain process steps, but will still show with, within the back-end branch account. This is currently impacting circa 40 branches since migration onto Horizon Online, with an overall cash value of circa 20,000 loss. This issue will only occur if a branch cancels the completion of the trading period, but within the same session continues to roll into a new balance period. At this time, we have not communicated with branches affected, and we do not believe they are exploiting this bug intentionally. The problem occurs as part of the process when moving discrepancies on the Horizon system into local suspense. Having looked at that description, again, do you recall any knowledge of, of that issue arising? I have no knowledge of that issue whatsoever. You have seen an example of the pro forma statement being submitted in support of the criminal cases uh, in court in September 2010, the one we've just looked at. Does it concern you at all that in the same year this bug was known about by Fujitsu and yet statements were being submitted to the court saying that at all material times the system was operating properly? Yes, it does. When you looked at that paragraph before, you said you took that to be referring to the audit workstations. Yes. So just revisiting that, do you think that paragraph could have been read more widely as referring to the Horizon system operating properly? I think it could have been worded better, yes, to what the that paragraph is actually in relation to. Because on its face, it was saying the system was operating properly. Yes. And looking at this, does this cause you concern, knowing that was in the witness statement? Yes. Going please to page three of this document, the solutions being considered were set out. 
and looking at solution one, please. <coughs> Alter the horizon branch figure at the counter to show the discrepancy. Fujitsu would have to manually write an entry value to the local branch account. Impact. When the branch comes to complete next tra trading period, they would have a discrepancy, which they would have to bring to account. Risk. This has significant data integrity concerns and could lead to questions of tampering with the branch system and could generate questions around how the discrepancy was caused. This solution could have moral implications of post office changing branch data without informing the branch. When you were security operations manager, were you aware that the software support center had remote access to the Horizon system? That they could remotely access the counter in a branch and alter the values? I was aware they had remote access. I wasn't aware that they had the ability to amend any data in there. Had you been aware, would this have been a cause for concern for you? Yes, because you shouldn't be able to manipulate data. So those are all the questions that I have for Ms Munro. Shall I turn to call participants or was there anything you wish to ask at this stage? No, let, let, let any call participants representative ask any questions. Uh, Mr. Uh, a question. Thank you. Um, I have a very brief follow-up question. Um, you were asked about the receipts and mismatch issue notes. There was a meeting, and uh, present at that meeting was Gareth Jenkins. Is that right? Do you recall? I don't recall. Okay. Do you need to see the doc? doc uh, yes, here? please. It is uh, POL 00028838. And right at the top. Do you see his name there? Yes. And at paragraph 21 of your statement, um, you, you've already confirmed in your statement and your evidence that you were Penny Thomas's line manager. That's correct. And at paragraph 21 of your statement, you say, I believe Gareth Jenkins was the senior solution architect for the Horizon system. He assisted Penny Thomas in understanding the, the ARQ data she would she retrieved as part of the litigation support service. And you say you believe he was on occasion called as an expert witness. That's correct. And you've been taken to statements that Mr Dunks gave um, in relation to that uh, standard paragraph. And correct. you're aware that Penny Thomas gave similar statements yes. as well, are you? So um, you said in your evidence today that you weren't aware of this receipts and payments mismatch no. issue. And we can see from the document that it affected, I think, up to 40 branches. Was Mr. Jenkins part of the wider team then? He was assisting Penny Thomas, who you line managed. That's right, isn't it? Yes. So, um, and you may not be able to answer this, it's likely, isn't it, do you think, that if Gareth Jenkins was present at this meeting, that when Ms. Thomas gave witness statements using that standard paragraph in 2010, mm -hmm. um, that she would have known about this because Mr. Jenkins was assisting her? I, I can't answer that because I wouldn't know what no. Gareth and Penny discussed. Um, he assisted her with the different <coughs> witness statements and the data. Whether they discussed these issues, I, I wouldn't know. Sorry. Do you accept that Ms Thomas in 2010 gave statements using those, those generic words about the Fujitsu system operating properly? Yes, there is the standard template. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think as her line manager, you ought to have known about these potential difficulties um, when Ms Thomas was using that paragraph, effectively giving Horizon a clean bill of health and criminal prosecutions of sub-postmasters? Um, I think because we'd got Penny discussed most of her issues or concerns or questions around um, the systems and that that service with the CISO and the account manager, then it was already at an escalated level. So 
I couldn't actually add any value in that way. So I think it was taken to that higher level rather because of the, the service that it's providing. Okay. We're just trying to understand the structure. So you were her line manager. Yes. But in relation to the evidence that she gave and perhaps the, the veracity of the evidence that she gave, there was someone else who she was reporting to. Is that right? Yes. So she liaised closely with both the account manager and the CISO. And um, a, a, a general question, and you may or may not be able to answer this, but having seen this and having been taken to the documents that you've been taken to today, um, do you consider that sub-postmasters were being prosecuted in circumstances where the post office, with Fujitsu's assistance, was misrepresenting the robustness and integrity of the horizon system? Based on what I've seen and read today, I would say yes. Okay, well, I don't have any more questions for you. Thank you very much. Sir, there's a question from Ms. Patrick. Good afternoon, Ms. Munro. My name is Ms. Patrick. I represent, with Mr. Maloney, a number of sub postmasters who were prosecuted and convicted and who since have had their convictions overturned. I have one set of questions about one document, so I hope we'll be quite quick. Um, the document is FUJ 0015618. And if we can go to the bottom of page one, we can see Ah, can you see that? That's been highlighted there, I think. There's an email there which starts, it's in January 2012, from Graham Branda to Penny Thomas and Andy Dunks. It says, Penny, Andy, and there's a little back and forth, but essentially it's a message about attending trial. If we can scroll up a little, but you see that, Andy, can you confirm if required, you're able to cover Penny's evidence in the case that she's unable to attend. You can scroll up a little, please. We see the second message. And we see, Hi, Graham. Thanks for the update. As far as standing in for Penny, I do not think my knowledge is good enough to be able to do this to the <coughs> level that Penny could answer the questions. I would not be comfortable to do it. Uh, and if we scroll up again, we see the next message. And we see this is where your copy's in. Can you see that, Ms Munro? Mm -hmm. um, and Ms Thomas copies the message to you and says, Donna, it would appear you have a gaping hole as far as prosecution support is concerned. Andy being uncomfortable to support a basic statement and Raj not being prepared to submit one. Now, so looking at this, <coughs> Miss Thomas is writing to you for your input, isn't she? Yes. And it appears your input is needed not just for matters of cover, but she's raising a substantive issue about what evidence the members of your team are qualified to give. Is that fair? It's not raising what they're qualified to give, it's what they're comfortable to give. Indeed. And there appears to be a hole in your team in terms of the prosecution support you're able to provide. Is that fair? From what we're reading here, that could be assumed, yes. So she's raising a gaping hole, and is that not an important gaping hole in prosecution support? Yes. Can you call, what did you consider her intent to be when she was raising that with you? She's bringing to light that individuals aren't happy to, to do the role that they've been employed to do. And what, why would she be raising that with you? What did she want you to do? Discuss with the individuals. Okay. Now, I'm going to, I won't bring the document up. I've got a piece taken here from what Ms Sanga says in her witness statement. She said to the inquiry, I can see that in around September 2010, 
I was asked to provide a witness statement in relation to an ARQ request that I actioned. Um, so separate occasion, but she's asked to provide evidence. She says, well, I can't recall if it was in relation to this ARQ request. I can recall speaking with Ms Monroe and agreeing that all witness statement requests would be actioned by Ms Thomas and Mr Dunks, as they had more experience and knowledge of Horizon. Now, if we can look at this, if, as she suggests, you agreed that all witness statements should be actioned by Ms Thomas and Mr Dunks, does that not suggest you had a more active management role in litigation support than your statement perhaps would have suggested? No, I managed the team and their workloads. Okay. okay. I have no further questions for you, Ms. Munro. Is that it, Ms. Price? Uh, yes, sir, it is. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Munro, for um, providing a witness statement and coming to give evidence. That um, concludes today's proceedings, I believe, Ms. Price. Yes, sir. I hope that um, those core participants who were present have found at least some of the evidence informative. And I think we have Mr. Patterson tomorrow, do we not? That's correct, sir. All right, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you.